In a dark part of town, a woman runs away from two would-be thugs, who corner her in a dark alley where she cannot escape. Suddenly, a boy appears behind them and tells them to run, but they only wonder what a child has to do with what is happening here. He should get lost if he knows what's good for him. The boy tells them once again to run away, if they don't want to die, that is. They both think that he is just making fun of them or trying to act tough, but still, they need to teach him that he shouldn't mess with grown-up business. As the boy takes off the band-aid that was on his neck, a few ants start to come out of the hole he was covering, and that's when the thug's friend is ripped in half and the blood sprays all over his face. The woman, who seemed to be the one in danger and very vulnerable, is actually an insector who knew that the boy was going to meddle with her meal, so she show her true self to be done with it. As the thug runs away, scared beyond his wits, the boy becomes increasingly engulfed in ants, and the woman calls him by his true name, the Black Ant. The next day, the Bug Reapers are fast at work analyzing the murder site, which seemed more like a battlefield, as there are cuts and holes everywhere around the area, with the addition of a yet unidentified lower body of a man. According to their witness, who didn't give them that much information due to his shock, there was a boy that was around the area. The main researcher pulls out a cigarette, and the smoke he unleashes kills a nearby mosquito showing its pesticidal attributes. The first sighting of the insectors was in 2005, as monsters resembling normal insects started appearing in the entire world. Everywhere they go, they cause harm, whether to feed or out of enjoyment. But the most disturbing thing about these creatures is that they have seamlessly integrated into society and live among humans without a care. These are the insectors. Most people still consider them an urban legend, but they are very real. So if they ever expect someone to be one, they should contact them ASAP. Signed, The Bug Reapers. This was a pamphlet read by the class head of a certain classroom. The teacher congratulated her for reading it so well, and he notes that most of them must already know of what happened yesterday in Namundan, but it seems that the police are certain that it's connected to an insector, so they shouldn't hang about after school ends and go straight home. The class head, Cho Ah, is asked by one of her friends, Bang Se Jin, if she didn't live in Namundan, which she confirms, so she asks her friend to go home together as she doesn't feel safe walking alone. Two guys start discussing the bug people too, with one asking if he thinks if these things are really real, the other believes it, as they have an insect in their class too. This guy, Kami Sun, who looks like a drone. The teacher asks everyone for the assignment he gave them last time, but the whole class starts groaning, which makes the teacher say that it will be graded even if they didn't do it or not, so it will affect their overall grades. As all of the students continue to groan and be angry that they didn't do their assignment, the teacher tells Cho to gather up every assignment and bring it to him once she is done. The bell eventually rings, and after the teacher leaves, the two boys tell Cho to not submit the assignments. As besides her and some other nerds, nobody has done it, so they should also sink with the ship and give it up. It's just a grade, after all. They start fighting about it, as Cho clearly doesn't want to do it only because they're irresponsible. But that's when Sun stops their argument by putting his assignment in Cho's face and telling her that this is his. She thanks him with a blush in her face. But as he sits down back in his seat, he spots an ant that walks up on his notebook and seems to resonate with him somehow. Out of nowhere, one of the bullies that were talking about the assignment earlier crushes it into his notebook, killing it instantly. He tells him to stop acting like a damn drone, as all he knows what to do is what others tell him. His face is also strangely annoying, and why does he even wear a bandage on his neck? He got a hickey or something. As Sun just looks at them, Cho asks her friend what a hickey means, which makes her immediately start blushing and tell the bullies to stop, as it's none of their business. Even with that, they decide to still take it off, revealing that he only has a big black spot on his neck. This makes one of the bullies mad, as why is he even trying to cover up something like this, to seem cool or interesting? That's when he notices that an ant comes out of that hole and crawls down his neck into his uniform, scaring him witless. He falls to the ground and swears to his friend that an ant just came out of him, making his friend think that he actually lost it. Jin asks Cho if she actually likes Sun, which makes her instantly blush and deny it. But in her head, it's only natural for her to like him. He is very athletic, studious, and eats like a bull. How can one not like a fine specimen like that? Later, Cho goes to the teacher's lounge and gives their teacher the promised homework, with only her and Sun having completed it. The teacher swears at the other students under his breath and says that she and Sun are free to go home, as everyone who did not do their homework must attend the garbage collection after school. As Cho walks back, she wonders if it's okay to say this to the others, 
as they might get angry if she tells them about it. But she also doesn't want to go home alone, so she gets the idea to invite Sun to come with her, as he also lives in the Naaman Dong area, if she remembers it right. When she walks back to class, she spots Sun putting back his band-aid in a nearby mirror, and she explains what the teacher told her, that they are free to go, so would he like to go home together with her, maybe? Sun apologizes, as he cannot do that, since he has some urgent business to attend to. Reluctantly, she lets him go, and at the incinerator, the students start to clean up, but the bullies are very mad that they have to stay behind and do something like this. Jin tells them to just clean up, as they will be done quicker. But when someone asks if they will at least get some extra grade credit for it, Cho responds with no, as she is crouching down and sweeping in quite a sad fashion. Jin asks her why she isn't just going home, but she says that she's actually waiting for her, while also explaining that Sun rejected her invitation, so she has nobody to go home with. Jin is surprised that she mustered this much courage, but isn't that guy just too harsh? He could have accepted. Cho tells him that she doesn't know a thing. He is actually very sweet and cool and a bunch of other colorful adjectives. As the others continue their work, the bullies go out behind a building for a smoke break, while still talking about Sun and the ant that crawled out of his neck. The bully who saw it promises to mess with him tomorrow, as he is not done, but it seems that he won't be able to, as an insector was waiting for them, eager for their flesh. He instantly kills the both of them, with one of the bully's heads flying directly at a classmate's feet. She immediately starts screaming and running away, while telling everyone to do the same, as there is an insector on the loose. As the insector comes out of his hiding place, he repeats the same words, I told you. He says them again and again while killing everyone who is not fast enough to dodge his onslaught. But even if the students try to get out of his way, he just seems too fast for them. Jin is suddenly pulled back by one of the male students who is now in full survival instinct, so it's only natural for him to do something like this. As she falls, she hits her head on a rock, with Cho immediately crouching down to her level and telling her to wake up as they have to run away now. Unfortunately for them, the insector is already behind her, repeating the same words. Cho gets up to defend her friend, but that's when the carapace of the insector opens up, and out of it comes the teacher's head, who notes that he told her to leave after school. She is shocked by this, but the teacher is extremely mad as he told her, yet she didn't do it. Now he must silence her for good. Before his mighty attack can crush her into bits, a fast and dangerous line of ants cuts both of his arms off cleanly, saving Cho's life. When she looks to see who saved her, she sees a person wearing a black suit, almost looking like a hero from the comics. As the black suit hero stands proud, Cho falls into unconsciousness, as all of this is too much for her, but the hero grabs her before she can fall. The teacher asks him why he is killing someone of his own kind, as he knows he is the famous black ant. But does he really fight for the people? This imposing figure seems to actually be Sun. The teacher starts screaming at him, as they are at the very top of the food chain. Thanks to their endless evolution, they have surpassed all other species on this planet. There is no longer a need to protect these insignificant creatures. They are not the bugs. Sun responds with a single punch that sends the teacher flying into the nearby building. He picks up both girls and gently puts them down somewhere safe, while saying that he does not fight for these people. He fights for something else. It's just like him. He is only hunting. The teacher asks if he is so malnourished that he would actually resort to eating his own, but fine. If he wants to do it that way, then so be it, as he also has a hard time finding food, so he will consume him and leave the humans be. He charges into Sun while in a ball shape, which actually manages to hit him, and even if he tries to stop the attack, it proves to be too powerful, so he is sent flying in some trees. The teacher notes that even without his arms, he can still kill a weakling like him, as if he is an ant. He should just sit still and be crushed like one. He ascends high into the air and launches himself towards Sun who cannot hope to dodge, so he is hit with the full brunt of the attack. The teacher does this again and again, leaving Sun's body utterly crushed under all of the force, with him unable to do anything. As the teacher prepares one final attack, the heaviest of them all, Sun tells the ant to prepare for combat as their opponent is coming. The teacher does manage to descend on him with full force once again, but he doesn't notice the gaping hole that he has in his chest due to Sun's secret weapon. With him in place, he uses transformation to remove the ants from his legs and enhance his arms, enhancing them into something truly monstrous. The teacher tells him to let go, and Sun does just that, as he throws him with full force. He doesn't stop there, however, as he uses the momentum to grab onto him and pummel him to the ground. 
Before the teacher can ask where his power comes from, Sun once again raises him in the air and starts crushing him slowly with his increased strength. The teacher begs him to stop, as he has not has not evolved enough in his life, he didn't reach his true form. Sun has no mercy for him however, and like a used soda can, he crushes him into bits. With his objective completed, he says that he is quite hungry, so he should go and eat. But behind him there is another insector, who apparently watched the fight go down with great anticipation. Eventually, the bug reapers appear, with tons of students taking pictures, and some reporters are also there to talk about the situation. The previous researcher, and a new one, start looking around the area, and they notice that this place also looks like a battlefield more than anything. Perhaps some insects were fighting, but why do that, since there were people here? The other researcher remembers what the thug told him about the kid appearing, and notes that it must have been for defense, be it territorial or something else. One of the bug reaper workers tells him that the schoolgirl who survived the beetle attack just woke up and said that a man donning a black hero suit saved her. As they walk to the ambulance, they hear that one of the other students who survived gets interviewed. He says that he instantly saved all of his friends who could not escape and quickly reported the scene to the bug reapers. He spits out all of these lies with a smile and he even tries to show them the footage that he recorded of the beetle beasts. But his recordings are blacked out and most are corrupted. The employee says that if that kid really had something, the journalists would have been on it first. So shouldn't they just get them out of here so that they don't interfere any longer? The smoking researcher tells him to ignore it, as this is not an urban legend any longer, so it's only natural for the media to get into it. The scarred researcher asks if this will even be taken seriously, as unless one is a victim themselves, it is hard to believe in the existence of these things. As they arrive at Cho's location, who is talking with her mother, she puts her respiratory helper back on her mouth, as she doesn't like people who smoke at school. He puts the cigarette out and says that it's actually an insect repellent, but he will stop for her. He asks about the situation. Does she recall anything important? She explains that when that monster that was once their teacher tried to kill them, a black-suited human appeared. The scarred researcher asks why she is calling that thing a human, which she doesn't really know. He just seemed like a human, even if he looked different. She was knocked out afterwards so she doesn't remember much else. But she knows that the guy who saved them was different. He protected them. The smoker researcher asks if there are any other students besides her that were exempt from doing the cleaning, and she says that there is only one, Sun. When he gets home, Sun's grandma invites him warmly and tells him to come and eat, as she has prepared all of his favorite dishes today. Sun looks at all of the food with a certain disgust, and says that he is not hungry today. That's when the grandma notices that he is bruised up and really dirty in some places, so she asks if he's fine. He confirms it while apologizing once again that he cannot taste her cooking, but to her it doesn't care, so long as he is healthy. She tells him to go in his room and not worry about the food, as she is sure that he needs to relax, but he still feels guilty about it, and says that he will eat it all in the morning. After he goes into his room, the grandma starts to cry, as their lively little boy has turned into a monotone person who becomes weirder by the day. As night falls, Sun's ants start carrying pieces of something with them, directly to his room, as he has left the window open slightly. While they do that, news about what happened at the high school starts blaring, where people around the area say their peace about the insectors. They are a blight on their peaceful lives, and it's very scary that they live among everyone without a care in the world. They should all be exterminated at once. The ants slowly go back into Sun's body, as he starts feeling the food that they got for him and where they got it from. A beetle. The next day, the police start searching an abandoned building, as they believe that it's tied to a series of child disappearances. The operation involved three people, a captain and two geared soldiers. They make it all the way to the third floor, where they move swiftly across the stairs, until they hear a bunch of strange sounds, and they stop. The captain slowly moves near a wall, and when he peeks to see what is in the room, they hear the noise. His eyes widen, as there are a bunch of cocoons placed here. Outside of this building, three people sit in a car, one of them being the smoking researcher leader. One of them, a part of the bug leader combat unit, Tay, says that this operation is rather boring. Can't they just go there and get rid of everything quickly? The other person from the combat unit, Sam, says that they are both still under review by the government, so it's only natural that the police have priority in this investigation. That's when the captain requests immediate support at the scene over the radio. Tay asks Sam why he is shaking so damn much, 
as he's going to stand outside mostly anyways. But the smoking research team leader, Pio, tells them to not joke around so much and get going already. The policemen inside begin cutting up the cocoons from the ceiling, with one of them feeling that they should have waited for the bug reapers, but the captain insists they get out of here as quickly as possible, since their opponent is an insector. As they start opening up the cocoons and allowing the kids to finally breathe, the other policeman is instantly killed through the cocoon opening. As the thing that was hiding in that cocoon was the insector they feared of, who asks them to let go of his children now. The other policeman immediately starts shooting in an attempt to cover his captain, but in a second the insector goes through him. The captain is shocked, as this creature is faster than anything he has seen before, and now it will be his turn to face it. Before the insector can get to him, a single bullet breaks his sprint and almost rips his pointy needle. This amazing shot was taken by Sam, who is very far away, and laments having missed the shot, as that thing is way too fast. The insector asks what they are doing, as using bullets might put his merchandise in danger. Have they no sense? He charges the captain once again, but this time he is stopped by Tay, who wonders why this scum is talking with such a high tone. The insector is surprised by his sudden presence, so it asks who he is, and as he hits it, Tay says that he is a bug reaper. As he gets thrown into the wall, Pio tells the captain to leave with the kids, as this is their business from now on. The insector gets mad at him, as there is no way he will just let that much money leave him. But before he can dash away, Pio uses his smoke to fully incapacitate his body for a short while. Pio explains that he will come with them quietly, and spit out everything about the children selling and more. The insector removes his needle fully, and says that weaklings like them should stay inside, as he wasn't looking for them. That damn black ant just isn't showing up. Before they can ask more, the insector unleashes tons of pointy needles at the two. Pio inhales all of the smoke at once and lets it out, while Tay uses his staff skills to deflect the projectiles. With this, the insector is allowed to escape the building, leaving the two to tell Sam to shoot. But it's too late, as he has been hit already, although he is still alive. They lament having lost the fly insector, but now there is nothing that they can do. After the incident involving the students, the school was closed for an entire week, as memorial for the dead children continued, and Su Young, who first reported the insector, was awarded with the Brave Citizen Award, something which he did not deserve. Cho looks at this on her phone while her brother is playing around, but he tries to scare her, so she gives him a good few thwacks to teach him a lesson. This makes him run away, as he will go and tell their mom, which she doesn't give a crap about. She hates having to look after her younger brother only because she is not going to school, as she isn't in the mood after what happened. She hears that he's trying to scare another person, but when she looks behind, she notices that it was Sun he was trying to scare, who's enjoying some ice cream. After this, they all start eating some with him, as he has bought plenty. But Cho can only think how she revealed his identity to the Bug Reapers. Maybe it was a bad idea. She asks if something bad happened recently, or he was disturbed. But Sun says that everything is fine, which comes as a relief to her. Her brother builds a pyramid out of the ice cream sticks, but that's when he notices a ball and goes to play soccer with the other child that is there. Sun begins to bite his ice cream stick even harder as he looks at them, making Cho wonder if he didn't have enough already. Suddenly the kids lose the ball, so they both start going after it together through a small rupture in the fence, while Cho tells her brother to get back here, but he doesn't listen. Sun says that he will go after him, which Cho tries to refuse, but he does so anyway. As he gets through the small rupture in the fence, he spots the other kid with a familiar mask, who asks him what he's doing while giving him a knowing glare. Cho's brother eventually makes it back to her, and explains that her friend told him to go back to her and wait. Sun tells the kid to sit still, but he says that he shouldn't be aggressive, as they are both hunters. However, when he was about to score his next meal, he decided to ruin it for him. He was already in a pretty bad mood because of some bug reaper bastards, but this just takes the cake. He will let him go since he seems like a complete newbie, but he will not be so merciful the next time, as he will beat him up if he finds him in his territory again. Sun pulls his band-aid off, and as he equips his armor, he asks what territory he's talking about. The insector is extremely surprised, but he is glad, as he has finally found the traitor hunter, the black ant. He has been waiting for him, as there are rumors that he eats other bugs these days, so if that's true, he must be aiming for him next. However, he already dared to interrupt him in a hunt, so he will eat him and become a superbug. The insector transforms into his original form 
and immediately strikes Sun, who just regenerates back his armor. The Insector is not done, however, as he keeps moving at lightning-fast speeds while mocking him for daring to fight someone as mighty as him. Sun just scratches his head, and with one shut up, he puts the Insector into the ground with a single punch, his patience having run out a long time ago. Eventually, Sun gets out of the wooden clearing and notes that he found the ball and took it back home to its owner. Cho's brother asks if he can eat more ice cream, as it seems to be too much for just one person. Cho finds his attitude rude, but Sun smiles and says that he can have it all, something which surprised her, as she has never seen him smile. She asks once again if they can have all of this, and he confirms it again, as he is very full now. In the wooden clearing, the insector's body lies desecrated, as the ants eat him slowly, but surely. After their sudden vacation is done, the students go back to school like nothing ever happened, with most just chatting about what they did with the week they had, and a myriad of other things. Nobody thinking about the insectors and how they are everywhere. When Cho gets to her class, she notices that her class, class 3, is closed for the time being, and each student that remains was transferred to another class. She wanted to at least respect their passing and hand some flowers over, but it seems that she can't, and with this, she is not the class president any longer. When she gets to her new class, class 1-5, she looks at her conversation with Jin, which is one-sided, as she hasn't responded to any of her messages, the reason unknown to Cho. She closes her phone, and is quite mad that she still ended up in class with that smiley bastard, who is recognized as a hero for no reason. Some students that were already in this class ask him what really happened, as they all know he didn't save any of his friends. He explains that if he hadn't been swift, he would have certainly passed away, as the teacher's punches were like boulders. Cho gnarls in his direction as he explains, but a female student near them hiccups one time and then gets up to face them. She swiftly walks up to Su Young and kicks him right in his family jewels, shattering them completely. Su Young asks what is wrong with her, but the student, Li Ye Jin, says that they are way too loud and they need to be taught a lesson in order for them to shut up. The other student that was acting cool with Su Young immediately turns into an order receiving soldier, as he does not want to mess with the famous Ye Jin. He gets out of her way immediately, with Cho admiring what she did and how confident she is in herself. Before she can walk out of the classroom completely, however, she meets face to face with Sun, who just looks at her before moving beside her to get into the classroom. As he enters the classroom, Cho invites him to sit next to her and he does just that, but as he does it she explains that Ye Jin is really cool. She actually managed to shut Su Young up by kicking him into a world of pain. Apparently she is also a real deal in this classroom. As she keeps yapping about the new class and so on, Sun just opens up a bag of chips and starts eating it before class starts, to appease some of his hunger. After the class finishes halfway, Sun tries his best to study, but his stomach just keeps growling, which is quite audible. So Cho invites him to join her for lunch later, as he seems quite hungry. He agrees, but as the teacher explains what will and will not be on the test, Sun suddenly feels the presence of another insector, which hits him like a truck as all of his senses tingle. After class inevitably ends, before Cho can even ask him to get going, he sprints out of the classroom, making her think that he really is hungry. Sun immediately jumps the school fence and starts running like his life depends on it, while the two bug reapers, Tay and Pio, discuss whether or not that fly insector is still alive or captured by someone else. Pio suggests that perhaps he is dead, as it seems that there are other beings that are hunting the insector for one reason or another. As they turn the corner, Sun bumps shoulders with Pio, making Tay scream at him to respect his elders, so he should at least apologize, but Sun does not stop running. Pio tells him to let it go, as that kid is probably just hurrying along somewhere important, but Tay still feels the need to scold him. They both arrive in the teacher's office, where they pull Cho out of her class, and Pio explains that they are here to interview the student who went home when the school cleaning was happening. Cho is surprised to see the smoking bug repellent bug again, but says that the student they are looking for just bolted home just moments ago. Perhaps he was really hungry. Tay believes that it was that rude student who bumped into them earlier, but with their business done, Pio hands Cho a business card and says that she should pass this on to her friend whenever she has the chance to. With that, they decide to go visit Sam at the hospital while Cho just looks at the card, which has a few words of information and a phone number. Below a bunch of roads, deep inside of some long forgotten tunnels, the insector that Sun had felt waits patiently, and sure enough, he arrives, ready to brawl in his full ant suit. The insector slowly descends from his waiting spot, 
and beckons him to come forward, clearly challenging him to a fight. Sun is the first to attack, but his attack is redirected, and the Insector uses his other hands to push him away. This does not stop Sun, however, as he moves in to throw another punch, making the Insector start to wobble and move weirdly. This is not because of Sun's punch, though, as he notices that one of his ants is on a piece of silk that is connected to the Insector. As a test, he summons a bunch of ants in a ball and throws them at the Insector, which eventually reveals that this Insector is actually being controlled by a bunch of silk strings that the ants manage to cut up, leaving the Insector lifeless on the ground. Sun gets closer to analyze the Insector, but as he picks up the strings, the Insector seemingly comes back to life and with a final smile, churns out a bomb from his stomach that immediately activates and explodes before Sun can even think of moving. After the dust clears, two Insectors stand before Sun, with one of them noting that he probably didn't expect something like that, right? But this must be his first time being caught, considering the countless murders he already did. The Silk Insector asks if he was the one that killed the fly, which Sun doesn't respond to. The Bomb Insector notes that with that damn fly out of the picture, they are left in a rather difficult position, as customers who were asking for young meat are now yelling at him only because he decided to play the hero. What a joke. He should know, though, that he is only killing him now because his hunting is interfering with his work, so he should feel unlucky or blame himself for this blunder. Before he can shoot another bomb, the Silk Insector decides to rip Sun's head off completely with a kick, but no blood spills out as she does this, as this was just a shell that Sun left behind. She is surprised when she sees this, but the bomb insector who calls her Silky says that they have been fooled. That bastard got away. Unfortunately for them, Sun did not run away and is now above Silky, allowing him to hit her straight in the head with a heavy boulder punch. He immediately moves on to the bomb insector, who despite his rather weak physical condition, moves swiftly, but not swift enough, as Sun's attacks start to go through. Out of pure desperation, the bomb insector unleashes a bomb that actually manages to hit him but he manages to defend himself with the few ants he has on him and go on the counterattack once again. Unfortunately, his attack is blocked by Silky, who congratulates him for getting the upper hand for a bit, but he shouldn't forget that this is a two-on-one. He has no real chance of victory. She keeps him tightly in place as she spins into the air, resulting in a deadly set of kicks that sends Sun flying, but also deplete all stamina that he has left, leaving him defenseless. The bomb insector points his weapon directly at his head and prepares to destroy his entire upper half. But Sun has not given up and tells the ants that were in the suit to move, even if they are swift. The bomb insector is prepared to unleash the attack and says that his hunt is finally over. A large explosion occurs, but this happens above them on one of the roads. As the bomb insector's weapon was redirected by Tay, who notes that he has to pay the fine for damaging that road with leaves or whatever insectors pay for. The bomb insector moves out of the way, and from behind them, Pio says that they actually dared to gather openly like this and start breaking things. This is just crossing the line at this point, or is it perhaps that they think that humans are weaklings? Something like this shouldn't happen, these damn pests, they should just all die. Seeing that the situation has become like this, the bomb insector pulls out a bomb out of his weapon, which surprises both Tay and Pio. But after he throws it, it's shown that it was just a smoke bomb allowing him and Silky to get away safely. Tay has had enough of these flying bugs, and Pio wonders if they could get some helicopter support one day. Tay thinks that it's fine, as they at least have this black ant to ask things of. But Sun is long gone, making him scream out, as the commander will have their heads for this blunder. Sun, while bleeding profusely, slowly but surely makes his way back home, leaving pools of blood everywhere he goes. When he gets back to his apartment, he starts eating all of the cooking that the grandma made for him, making her wonder what happened, as he came back home injured and with an endless hunger in him. Just what did he go through now? Sun thinks that he could not devour a single thing, so he has to fill this hunger up with something else, but even so, he is still too hungry. After he is done eating, he makes his way to his room and closes the door, but as immediately as he's behind closed doors, the pain starts and the questions of others start popping up in his mind. Why is he killing his own kind? To protect humans, that is not the reason. He remembers how the fly insector told him that he broke the rules of their world by eating his own kind, but that's not it. As those rules have no meaning for someone like him, he has to eat and eat, eat until there is nothing left. Otherwise, he will be the one that is eaten, as the ants are doing right now, causing him to scream out in pain. 
In a broken down warehouse, a familiar figure pulls three corpse bags around using string, eventually arriving at a cooling room where they throw the corpses in so that they are as fresh as possible. However, one of the corpses is not a corpse, as inside, there's a living human who begs for salvation. The person throws him in with the others and slowly starts closing the door, as the man who continues to beg for his life is engulfed in complete darkness, forced to freeze with the other lifeless corpses around him. Somewhere else in the warehouse, an elderly man smashes the table, as he's extremely mad that they didn't manage to capture the black ant, as that would have surely attracted the attention of the heavenly insects. However, those damn bug reapers just decided to come out and ruin their plans. If it wasn't for them, they could have made something of themselves. He tells the familiar figure, who is actually Ye Jin, to increase the human supply, as what she is bringing in right now just isn't enough. She says that she is increasing it already, but he should keep something in mind, that she doesn't enjoy doing something like this, so he should stop saying it like she is lazy or something. The now identified bomb insector notices her uniform and walks closer to her as the uniform she has on right now is the exact same as that guy's, the black ant. Does she perhaps know who this black ant figure really is? She smacks his hand away harshly and says that he has become quite annoying. Just how would she know that bastard? There are countless students in their school as it is. She can't just know all of them. The bomb insector says that it still doesn't matter, as the fact that he is a fellow student still stands, so she should easily find him and kill him, as he has caused enough damage as it is. She is hesitant to do this, as she is already doing very difficult work as it is. Why does she have to do this much work for that bastard? Before she can say what her goal is, the bomb insector starts choking her as he says that previously, she said that she would do anything. But now his orders have come dirty and ugly? Did she really think that she could work with the prestigious thousand-legged work with only this amount of resolve? How pathetic. Suddenly, his dog starts barking uncontrollably at one of the human supplies that is getting away. The bomb insector looks at this out of the window and then on the cameras, noticing that the freezer door is wide open and one bag is empty, so he asks Ye Jin if she forgot to lock the door, but she says that this is not the case. Even if this does put him at a disadvantage in terms of numbers, he will overlook it, as this is a human mistake and she has yet to fully develop as an insector. He transforms his hand real quick and says that they should continue their conversation, as he will deal with this easily. So what did she want to say? Yejin says that she's quitting, as this partnership is way too toxic at this point, and she isn't getting that much from it. The bomb insector clicks his finger one time, making the man outside start to glow, and his whole body starts to burn in a fiery glow as the bomb tucket in his chest activates, exploding in a fiery cloud. The bomb insector says that she already knows how he deals with things that try to get out of his grasp, so he will say it again, only because he is considerate of her. She will kill the black ant. Back at school, students line up for the cafeteria after their first class, but the lunch lady doesn't want to give the incoming students any more sausages, as then the first grades will have nothing to eat then. But that's when Su Young, who is also waiting in line for his food, notices that Sun has finished tray upon tray of food, and he is still eating, much to everyone's surprise. Even Cho's who believes that he is eating more than usual. Just what is wrong with him, to be feasting like this? Sun continues to chug food down his throat, but this doesn't stop the ants, who are still hungry and are now munching on his flesh once again. He starts to shake and wail in pain, making Cho asks if everything is alright, as he looks rather sick, but that's when Su Young comes next to him and says that he is rather selfish, as some people are too poor to even get a single thing from the cafeteria, but he just gets unlimited refills whenever he wants to? Is he perhaps the son of a banger or something? Cho tells him to get off him, as he paid for every meal that he has eaten, it's not like he gets these for free. Su Young finds it amazing that he was able to pay for 10 entire lunches, but the food that he managed to gulp down is far beyond human limits. Is he perhaps an insector? This makes the once chatty cafeteria hall fall silent, until Cho starts screaming at Su Young for being a jackass. But this also attracts Ye Jin's attention. Cho and Su Young continue fighting about Sun, as he feels that he is certainly hiding something, since he wasn't there on the cleanup day. They fight and fight, until an ant bites deep into Sun's succulent flesh and his whole world starts to turn upside down, as Su Young starts screaming that he is a suspicious bastard. Suddenly Sun grabs him by his jaw and pulls him high in the air, but he finds the humanity in him to throw him away into another student and run away, 
as he can't control himself any longer. Ye Jin takes note of this, while Su Young sits defeated, with food on his head. As Sun walks up the stairs, his hunger increases more and more, and the ants, who were once docile, start coming out of him as he has lost control over them. They come out of him and take control of his entire being, while Ye Jin, who also climbed up the school, notes that it seems that he likes to advertise that he is the black ant in front of other insectors. She apologizes, as she has no ill will towards him. She could care less that he eats other insectors, but she has her reasons. As she completes her transformation, Sun notices an insector in front of his rage-filled eyes, so he rushes in to take a bite, as that is the only thing that can appease his hunger. Ye Jin instantly summons a bunch of silk and blocks his incoming attack. Will this fight finally reveal Sun's true identity to everyone else? As Sun is passed out, he dreams of his insides, where four large ants are holding him in place, while another comes to take his head. He asks them, how much blood do they want? How much slaughter must he do to appease them? Has he not done enough already? As it is? The ant slowly makes its way to his head, and before eating him, it says that it's not nearly enough. That's when a red ant comes to his rescue, and much to his surprise, slaughters every single ant that stood in his way, as it is much bigger than them. He can only wonder what this is about. As he wakes up in his bed, his hunger and pain seemingly subsided. He gets out of bed, but doesn't remember a single thing about what happened on the roof. Did the ants manage to kill that girl, Ye Jin? His grandma says that he is finally awake. He should eat something to reinvigorate himself, but Sun refuses, as he is quite full. The grandma wonders why that is. Did he perhaps catch any bugs? He doesn't remember anything of the sort, so he asks how he got back home. She explains that a tall girl carried him here, the one with yellow hair. She brought him here while she was all covered in blood, but she was rather suspicious. Is she of the same species as he is? Sun says that they are just in the same class, while wondering why the ants calmed down, as if they hadn't eaten her. Just what appeased their hunger? Suddenly he feels another insector signal, this time from someone else. Someone is calling out for him. The bomb insector and Ye Jin sit in a calm and unpopulated field, with the bomb insector saying that she made his job even more difficult. She says that she tried her best, but the bomb insector says that if she did, she should have killed him and be done with it but she didn't. She gets mad at this, as she can see the amount of injuries that she has. If he really wants him dead, then he can go ahead and fight him. That guy is no normal insector. The bomb insect's eyes turn vicious, as he feels Sun's presence, who is hiding under the train bridge, only visible after the train passes. They both start to transform, as the bomb insector tells her to not be a disappointment now, but she tells him to shut up and do his job. She rushes into Sun with a kick, but he easily blocks it and creates a mighty punch that hits her right in the stomach and manages to break some of her carapace armor. She feels that he has gotten stronger, but instead of finishing her off, Sun decides to ignore her, as his target is the guy behind her. She starts screaming at him, as this fight isn't over yet, but he says that the bomb bastard will run away if they continue to fight. The bomb insector calls her a useless weakling, but even with this, Ye Jin grabs Sun's leg and tells him that even if he thinks that way, ignoring her like this is too damn ugly. If she can't catch him, then how could she ever achieve her goal of taking revenge on the celestial insects? How can she possibly do that? The bomb insector calls her a useless thing that is crawling on the floor like a true bug, but now she can be disposed of without any remorse. Ye Jin asks him to stop, as they had a deal, but the bomb insector says that she doesn't know a thing. Did she really think that he would help with her revenge? Who in their right mind would dare to rebel against the celestial insects? After everything was done, he was planning on giving her to them, just as she deserves. Ye Jin damns him for all that he's worth, as she has endured gruesome things because of him. But now, she will be put down by him like a sick dog? The bomb insector thinks that the end for worthless beings is pointless struggle, but she should be happy as she won't go out alone, if she keeps holding on to that leg, that is. Before he can fully activate the bomb inside of her, Sun moves swiftly to get out of his line of sight and attempt a sneak attack, but that's when a bomb near Ye Jin blows up, making the bomb insector laugh. As he has filled this whole damn field with landmines, he has no chance of getting to him, as he will only die a pointless death. Sun summons everything in him to get even more speed, more and more. He starts to turn blood red, just like the ant that rescued him in his dream, redder and redder until not even the bombs can catch up to him. The bomb insector tries to hit him, but he is too swift, something which even Sun recognizes, as this speed is otherworldly. With this, he is able to easily take out the bomb insector by tearing off his entire head. 
As he stops, he wonders where this power is coming from and why his legs have grown to this size. Ye Jin watches in awe as the newly transformed sun stands victorious. The redness from himself starts disappearing eventually, so he throws the head of the bomb insector next to his corpse and tells the bugs to eat as he turns back to normal. As they do that, Ye Jin notices that he is approaching her, so as he stares deep into her soul, she prepares for the worst, but he lets her go. He just walks past her. This makes her mad so she tells him to stop, as she has something to ask him. Why did he save her? Does he have a plan or something? Is he also fighting against the celestial insects? That must be it, right? If that is the case, she wants to join. Sun interrupts her and asks a question of his own. What happened on the roof of the school when he went berserk? She is surprised that he really doesn't remember a single thing, as she thought that he would. After she started fighting him, he proved that he was stronger. Even in this demeted form, she had never seen an insector like this ever before. As the ants almost finished her off, Sun stopped them with the last of his consciousness, as he will not let these things control him like they own him. This act angered the ants, so they started to go after him. But that's when Ye Jin jumped into action and stopped them from striking him. But why would he even harm himself like this? Does this monstrous side of himself have a will? That's when one larger ant started to glow in his exposed heart, which made him scream out and dispel all of the ants away, before falling to the ground. She was surprised by all of this, as she had never seen anything similar in the entire time she has been an insector. But this made her think for a long while. Does she kill him, or should she sell him and make some decent cash? That's when she had a thought, that perhaps, he is the hidden card that can completely annihilate the celestial insects. That is why she carried him all the way to his house. But from now on, he should think carefully about his next move. He has become the target of the celestial insects. And since this bomb bastard is dead, the supply of humans in this area will decrease. So they have little time before they start digging deeper into what happens. When that happens, can he confidently say that he will be the only target? His family, his friends, even humans, who so much as dared to brush shoulders with him will be targeted. Everything he knows and likes will be hunted down. However, she can help him. If they fight together, they might actually be able to win against them. Sun asks her, help him? He doesn't really care about those things at all. No matter who or what it is, he will devour it, not leaving a trace behind. He suddenly grabs Ye Jin and starts filling her mouth with ants, which makes her let out a blood-curdling scream. The next day, as school starts, the teacher in Sun's class starts taking attendance. He continues to call out people, but he eventually gets to Ye Jin, who does not answer, as she is not here. The teacher is quite confused by this, as she is not the type of person to just miss a day, even if she does skip classes. So he asks anyone if they have her contact in order to see what happened. Su Young's friend says that the strange girl has no friends, which makes Su Young laugh and say that he heard there was a strange incident at Namunchen yesterday. His friend says that it must be her, as he has seen her over there a few times. If they report this, they will certainly become big shots. Ye Jin suddenly appears and tells them to stop speaking ridiculous things, but they should come to her after school ends, as she has something that she has to talk with them privately. This makes the two smiley dumbasses not smile anymore. She confirms to the teacher that she is here, and Sun thinks about only one thing as she does so, the celestial insects. At the site of their previous battle, a bunch of bug reapers are gathered, with them only finding a prosthetic leg among the battle site which makes them think that it's probably the insector that their leader talked about, a bombardier beetle, as nothing else could have caused so many explosions. After shaking it a bit, they find something in the prosthetic leg, a small sealable package with a strange thing inside of it. Suddenly, a large man appears and looks directly in the direction of the prosthetic leg, with one of the Bug Reaper researchers trying to stop him from entering. This makes the man holding the package look at him, but another Bug Reaper comes next to the intruder and tells him to go away, as this area is too dangerous for normal people like him. Not liking the Bug Repellent that was put right next to his head, the man removes the Bug Reaper's hand in one fell swoop, making him scream and reveal that he is actually an Insector. The Bug Reapers that are there immediately get ready for battle, and they also try to report to their headquarters that an Insector appeared. But in an instant, the Insector punches them like they are butter leaving only the Bug Reaper that had the sample. He screams at the top of his lungs, but he cannot hope to win against this Insector. After he is done butchering them, he calls someone and says that the sample has been secured. The man over the phone asks if there were any incidents, but he says that everything is fine, while looking at what the package contains, a certain type of bug. 
As class continues, Ye Jin uses a small amount of her power to throw something to Sun, which goes past Cho as well, who notices it. Sun catches it, and it's revealed that it's only a note, asking him to come through the back door after class. He does just that, and they meet behind the school, where Ye Jin says that this would be the first time they actually talked at school, which feels kind of awkward, because it's so normal. Sun asks what she wants from him, which makes her sigh, as he probably already knows and this time he can't pretend that he doesn't remember. She thought that she was really going to die from what he did. Back when he grabbed her by her jaw and poured ants into her mouth, she passed out. But when she woke up, she started puking out something. The bomb that she had inside of her, destroyed by the ants. The simple fact that he decided to spare her and just left, means that he will accept her request for cooperation. Isn't that right? Sun doesn't know what she's talking about, as she seems to be mistaken about something. He didn't save her out of the kindness of his heart. She is just emergency food, ready to be eaten whenever he runs out of targets. She feels kind of gross after he said that, as it is rather extreme. But really, he should think about things carefully. Did he just forget what she said? He is now officially the target of other insectors. In essence, all insectors have a single shared purpose to drive humans out from the top of the food chain and become the true apex predators. To achieve this, they are growing in size and are adapting to anything that gets in their way. Even so, Sun really has no interest, as it doesn't seem all that important to him. Cho looks at the two of them, having a pretty active talk, and she feels kind of jealous, as she didn't expect those two to actually become friends, as she doesn't feel any connection between them. That's when she notices two boys looking at the news on their phone, where it is shown that a new insector fighting suit has been made, and it looks very cool to them. In that facility, Tay is getting suited up in the suit, while Pio and Sam watch. Pio asks how it is, which he confirms that it isn't bad. But does he really have to wear a thing like this? Pio explains that very recently, they lost four members in an accident. He doesn't want the same thing to happen to his team members, so if he can increase their survival rate by at least 10%, that would be plenty. Even he might take one and wear it if it works well enough. The leading Bug Reaper Science and Technology Department leader, simply named Doctor, says that they will see if that is possible for someone of his stature. With the preparations done, they will now conduct a physical test, which Tay doesn't feel so good about, as he doesn't have a weapon. Pio tells him to use the built-in dagger that is positioned in his right arm, but he should be ready now, as they will let the insector in. Tay still has more to say, but at this point nobody will listen to him. They order the tiger beetle they captured to transform, which makes the insector mad, as he doesn't like being ordered around. But they tell him that he can go all out and do as he wants. This makes him smile as he transforms, as it's been a while since he tasted the thrill of a real kill. In the second he transforms, he disappears from Tay's field of vision, appearing right behind him and throws a mighty punch, but Tay manages to block it with ease, which makes him say that this suit might be worth something yet. Pio says that it increases his physical abilities by more than 80 times that of a normal everyday human. As the insector dashes away once again, Doctor tells him to be cautious, as that thing can reach a speed of 300 kilometers per hour, or 186 miles. The insector attacks him once again, but this time he is prepared, so he manages to cut him a bit with the blade and kick him with his superhuman force. Even though he has just been injured, the insector smiles, as this is extremely fun for him. Unfortunately for Tay, his left arm broke because it was hit two times, which they note that this must be the suit's limit currently, but the doctor can't help but wonder if it can withstand even more. In an instant, the insector jumps on him and starts choking him out on the ground, but that's when the suit unleashes a large quantity of volts into the insector. Doctor explains that once he has received some real damage, a current of 100,000 volts will go to the insector he is currently facing, which makes Tay wonder why he told him only now. With this, the test is completed, so they pull the insector away from him and send him back to his cell, as captured inspectors are valuable for their organization. As he leaves, the insector turns around and tells Tay that they should play again sometime, as this round was quite fun. This naturally weird out Tay, or angers him, or maybe both. Pio walks away from the testing area and thinks about the recent incident, where three combat personnel were killed in the blink of an eye, so if the insector is awakened, will the suit really make a difference? However, there is no way that such a situation just happened out of the blue. He must go and investigate further and find if there's anything that could help them. He goes into a library and starts reading things. He reads and reads, almost emptying up an entire shelf of books. 
In the end, he doesn't find anything of essence from the books, just stuff that they already knew, so this is a waste of time. That's when he notices a book tucked away deep in a bookshelf, named The Ant Castle Project. Ye Jin is mad that Sun is still not listening to her after all that she explained, but he should know that her real target is a certain person, which Pio also finds in the project book, named Kijima. Sun suddenly grabs Ye Jin and tells her to repeat the name of that person. Who was it? She says that it's the leader of the celestial insects, Kijima. Sun still remembers the time when Kijima killed his mother, who even in her last moments, assured him that everything was going to be fine. After school is done, Ye Jin grabs Sun tightly and says that if he doesn't have anything to go today, they should go somewhere. Sun refuses, which makes her think that perhaps he is actually going to go hunting, as there might be some insectors near. But Sun tells her to stop talking nonsense and keep her distance. Ye Jin tells him that it's a real shame that he acts in such a way. They could have eaten some meat together in order to celebrate their reunion as normal people. Sun immediately gets mad, as he believes that she is thinking about eating humans, but Ye Jin confirms that it's not what she was talking about. She hasn't eaten a single human since she became an insector. Perhaps it's because she awakened as a silkworm, but she doesn't feel the need to eat human meat. Besides, she will buy some really nice meat for him, so they should go and eat. As he hears that, Sun is already in front of her and tells her to hurry up. They go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, where they both top their plates with good cuts of meat. But Sun is rather impatient at waiting for the meat to be done, since he could also eat it like this, and nothing bad would happen. The employee there says to his boss that he might be screwed, as they took a lot of meat. But the boss tells him to not speak that out loud in front of the customers, and that he will teach him how it really is. This is how Buffets make their money in the first place. People take a lot of meat since they are hungry, but they can't eat much in the end, so they will charge a penalty for the meat that is left over, which is where they make their money. As he keeps bragging about the genius of the man who came up with this idea, the employee tells him to look at them as all of the meat is done. They both unhinge their jaws as they slurp down the meat within seconds. As they continue eating, Ye Jin asks Sun how he knows about Kijima, which makes him think again of his mother, but he refuses to tell her. She says that it's fine if he wants to keep it to himself, as that guy just probably went after his family, like he did with hers. Her mother and father were both killed by him, and she can never ever forget the words that he said when he left her alive only. They do not kill their own kind, but they also don't need these inferior beings any longer, so she should awaken and become as powerful as she can. Sun continues eating while she explains, which makes her order another tray of meat, since they have almost run out. The owner looks at this, and tells the part-timer that he is officially cooked. After they are done bankrupting the buffet, they go and get something to drink, with their orders being quite specific. She also asks what he wants, as he is at a distance for some reason. As he tells her, he feels that an insector is near. He closely analyzes everyone, until he notices someone smooth talking a lady into coming to his house, as it's better than a cafe since he is an artisan at making coffee. She feels that his approach is a bit forward, but he makes her laugh by saying that he will eat her up. He does manage to make her laugh, not knowing that he meant it in the literal sense, as this guy is an insector. After Ye Jin is done picking up the drinks, she notices that Sun is shaking and looking at a couple, making her wonder if he feels lonely. He explains that the guy is an insect, so he will be going after him. Later, Cho takes the bus to the hospital where her friend, Se Jin, is still hospitalized because of the incident. She goes up to her room and asks if she would like to meet face to face. But after not getting a response, Cho leaves the gifts she got from her and a letter. As she walks away from her door, she notices two people arguing, a man who asks how he dared to shave the head of a child that was about to debut, and a doctor who says that if they did not take action right then and then, she would have been in danger. This makes Cho remember that Sei Jin was very excited that she passed her audition to become an idol. That's when a gorgeous nurse walks past her, who is smiling for some reason. Sei Jin sits in her bed, still thinking about what happened that day, but her door suddenly creaks open, making her scream out, thinking that it's Cho. It is not Cho, however. It's the pretty nurse, who doesn't seem to be a nurse at all. If this is how nurses looked, I'd pray for being hospitalized. She says that she must be really angry at the people that did her wrong, but she shouldn't bottle it up, like she has been doing. She pulls out the strange parasite thing that we saw previously and says that with this, she can have revenge on those annoying humans. She gives it to Sei Jin, who is too puzzled to refuse, but the second it enters her system, she starts convulsing all over the place, and she also screams out, making the woman laugh, as this is exhilarating for her. The woman and the smooth talker arrive back at his place, 
which is a pretty big mansion with a pool inside, which the woman is pretty surprised by, as she has never seen something like this. The insector tells her to not be so surprised, as it looks pretty embarrassing, but she should go ahead and play all she wants in the water. He kicks her into the water as he says this, but as she starts swimming, she says that the water is just too deep for her, as she is already tired from it, but she can't find him anywhere. This is because he is actually below her, smiling ear to ear at the prey that he's about to consume. Seeing that the man isn't anywhere around, she decides to get out of the water, as is pretty tired as is. That's when the man grabs her ankle and pulls her deep into the water, before taking her even deeper and knocking her out completely by throwing her at the bottom. As she floats, the man sits next to her and thinks that this is rather boring. He wanted to try something new, because he usually just orders for human meat whenever he is hungry, but whatever, as now he should go ahead and consume her before she decides to wake up. As he unhinges his jaw, he notices something very strange, a black figure that is changing shape right outside his window, which is also giving him an all-knowing look. After Sun transforms completely, he punches through the glass without any remorse. Before the Insector can even react, Sun rushes him with a deadly dropkick that sends the Insector flying into the wall. This isn't enough to stop him, however, so he rushes back in and punches Sun, something which sends Sun back a bit. As he flies through the air, Ye Jin uses a silk technique in order to completely engulf the Insector and catch him in a cocoon of silk. She also pulls out the harmless woman out of the water, who did not suffer any serious injuries. Ye Jin notes that it was a good thing they decided to follow after them, otherwise she might have been minced meat by now. The Insector is very mad with them, and asks what kind of bastards dare to disturb someone else's meal like this. They both get in front of him, and he asks if they can even handle the consequences of attacking him. Do they even know who he is? Sun doesn't care, as he will consume him nonetheless. Ye Jin tells him to stop, as if they capture him, he might prove to be useful to them, even if he does seem like a bastard. The Insector finally gets who he is, he is that black ant fellow, who hunts his own race only. He naturally heard the rumors about him, but he seems to be more troublesome than advertised. However, he is going to devour him, him and his little fairy friend. As he starts to transform, Ye Jin tells him to not even try it, as he can't hope to get out of his restraints now. But unfortunately for her, he starts doing just that, as they have severely underestimated him. The two have seconds to move out of the way, as the Insector unleashes a myriad of scorching hot blades that even manage to hit them, but not at full speed, which reduces the damage they take. After the blades are done flying about, and the Insector has made some distance between them, he explains that they shouldn't have been so confident just because they hunted down some small fries, as they cannot hope to defeat him. A member of the Heavenly Insect, their arrogance will be their undoing. This is Zagana, a pond skater insect. He beckons them forward, as he wants to see what they are capable of. So they both jump at him while unleashing their techniques. But Zagana smoothly blocks them, and uses his twin sword technique to slash both of them in a heartbeat, showing just how much power the Heavenly Insect group has. As Sun falls from the air because of the attack that pierces him, Zagana prepares to unleash another attack in order to finish him off. But Ye Jin arrives just in time to get Sun out of the way. After she lands, she wonders how he can get this much speed, but seeing that he is able to stand on water, it's probably his ability. If they go anywhere near the water, it will be a kill zone, as he is very swift there. She thinks that all of the Heavenly Insect members are very strong, even among other Insectors, but she never thought that it would be to this extent. As she thinks, Sun just decides to go in once again, while telling her to lay some silk thread on the surface of the water. She doesn't know what is going on in his dumb head, but she does this nonetheless. Sun charges in with even faster speeds, as he wants to manifest that red power once again, he needs to, in order to win this fight. As he approaches Zagana, he cuts one of his antennas off, making Sun think that he needs to get rid of his dual swords, as these things are the main issue in this fight. They continue to trade blows, with Sun becoming progressively redder and redder as the fights go on, with his punches also becoming more deadly. However, as he tries to go for another punch since Zagana is now defenseless, his face is suddenly revealed as his face armor is cut in half. It seems that the swords that were in his back aren't just for decoration, as he put his other swords on his legs and is now pulling out the swords from his back, revealing his true fighting form. With his newfound speeds, he unleashes a powerful attack on Sun in the blink of an eye, which makes him bleed. Zagana then notices that there is thread all over his swords, something which he did not notice. But even so, she is too arrogant with her movements, as she cannot hope to injure him enough. 
She uses all of her power in order to cut his head off, but his armor is just too strong, so he smiles as he strikes the water below him, creating an attack that pierces through Ye Jin with ease. She starts screaming from the pain and Zagana, thinking that he needs to end her existence in a flashy fashion, throws one of his swords in the air, which will definitely hit her. However, before it can do that, Sun moves swiftly and grabs the sword, allowing him to pierce the arrogant Zagana with his own blade. He tries to hit Sun with his remaining sword, but he defends himself with all that he can, while sending ants through the sword, which go and eat Zagana's insides slowly, making him scream out in pain. Before he can fully kill him, the buff insector from before comes around and socks Sun straight in the face, sending him flying towards a wall. He notices that they actually managed to defeat this dumbass, so he throws an invitation card near Sun, as strong people are always welcome. This card is for a certain club, named Six Shot, a place only for the strong and vicious. In a dark alley where nobody dares to go into without a good reason, Sei Jin approaches a fat boy, who signed up for a dating app that she is also a part of. He says that they should go ahead and start their date, maybe go somewhere to eat first, but that's when she suddenly approaches him and says that she wants a kiss, which he happily accepts, but thinks it's rather straightforward, not that he minds. Suddenly his insides start to be churned out, and his whole body becomes brittle and skinny, as Sei Jin has eaten him up from the inside, using her newfound abilities. The pretty woman comes around and hugs her, asking how her first taste of human flesh is. As she licks her lips, she smiles, as it certainly was very delicious. In a random train, people are living just like usual, with most looking at their phones while others just zone out, waiting to arrive at their destination. But suddenly a man starts talking to himself out loud, apologizing to someone or something as it's hungry, but he doesn't know how to feed it. That's when he gets the directive to consume, and a large tentacle mouth comes out of his mouth and starts consuming anyone that stands in front of him, and in such an enclosed space, it was easy for him to kill all of them, but now he has enough food to feed the thing that was commanding him. As Cho walks to school in the morning, she notices Sun, so she moves a bit faster to catch up to him, but when she finally does, she notices that he is all beaten up and pretty swollen, leaving her quite puzzled. When they walk into school, she asks how he got so many injuries, with him explaining that he just had a fight, that he won, but he also lost, if that makes sense. Cho is surprised by this, as he doesn't seem to be the type that gets into fights for no reason. But Sun says that he really couldn't help it at that point. When Cho looks in the class, she spots Saijin, who finally came to school. She jumps out at her because she hasn't seen her in a long time, and also asks if she's fine, as she didn't get to visit her at all. Saijin says that she just didn't want her to see her hair like this, but Cho says that it suits her, and the bracelet that she is wearing is also really cute. Cho notes that Sun is also in the same class with them, and Seijin asks if someone is sitting in this seat. Cho explains that this is the seat of Ye Jin, the leader of the class, and probably the strongest person too. In a pretty small apartment that could be considered a storage room for most, Ye Jin sits in her makeshift bed, as she is still recovering from her injuries. She also messaged Sun about if he is going to school or not because of his injuries, but it seems that he is already at school, making her wonder what kind of regeneration he has. She also thinks that this is the first time she ever skipped school without even going to attendance, which is quite weird to say the least. Back in class, Su Young spots that Seijin is back, but with an entirely new haircut. He greets the former idol trainee and also looks at the back of her head, noting that it must have hurt tons when it happened. Well, she just cracked that part of her head, so she should consider herself lucky, as the other kids died, even if they ran desperately just like her, in order to survive at least one more day. Naturally, those who are meant to live will most certainly live. Since she survived in such a healthy manner, it's fine if he feels a little less sorry for her, right? She survived for goodness sakes. Seijin has had enough of his heartless yapping, so she gets extremely mad and a red glint appears in her eyes, making Sun perk up, as he just felt the presence of an insector. But before Seijin can do anything, Cho gives Su Young a punch that almost knocks him on his ass, making Seijin calm down from her fit of rage. Cho starts screaming at the top of her lungs, He's a crazy bastard that doesn't even know how to apologize properly. He's a little less sorry? How could a bum like himself say that when he was the one that threw her away to save his sorry ass? He should apologize properly now. With a rather calm expression, Su Young apologizes to the both of them. But as he walks away, he notes that everyone is giving him a hard time because of what happened. But they will soon find out that they messed with the wrong person. Sun continues feeling this familiar yet unfamiliar energy. It is unstable because it resembles an insector, but it really isn't, 
and he also knows where it's coming from. Saijin, in the same train where the possessed man started eating all of the passengers, it seems that he ate enough to not even resemble a human anymore. Two bug reapers come to clean the place out, younger brother Ko and older brother Ro, who are both disgusted by what they see. Ro wonders if this guy is similar to the insects that were in Xiong Chun, but Ko says that this larva-like thing and those guys are very different. Even so, Ro says that it's better to take this guy in back to the headquarters, as that old man would surely be very happy about it, since he will have a new toy to play with. The larva insector starts screeching and charges into Ro, but Ko manages to catch it with his knife and starts shooting it with his shotgun. But as Ro tells him to keep the damage to a minimum, he gets slapped away by the insector, who uses its tail to throw him into a window. Naturally, Ko is worried for his brother, but he forgets about that worry once the insector chooses to try and whip him out of the way too. Unfortunately for the insector, Ko is much stronger when it comes to pure strength, so he grabs the insector and throws it high into the air, allowing his undamaged brother to go ahead and slash the insector's neck off. Ro asks if he really thinks he's that weak, but Ko laments having killed the thing as he tried to catch him without damage, but he just cut off its head with no rhyme or reason. Ro notes that it's about time they go back, but that's when a really small larva, all too similar to the big one, pops out of the corpse, which looks at Ro and beams itself into his head in a split second. Ko asks where it went, as he didn't quite catch it, but his now controlled brother notes that they shouldn't worry about it and head back to their headquarters. Eventually, they arrive at the Bug Reaper B branch, Sector B, where Ko notes that when that old man sees what they got for him, he will be so surprised he will die from it. Ro says that the old man is already on his deathbed, which surprises Ko, as he didn't expect such a grim comment from him but he doesn't get to ask him about it as Tay and Kim greet them, as they heard they caught a pretty large larva. Unfortunately for them though, they caught something much faster, and were the first. Ko notes that if they hadn't stopped on the way, they would have been here first, but Tay says that it's their fault, since they stopped during working hours. Also, why is the packaging torn? Did they perhaps try to carry it together because it was too heavy? They actually caught theirs in almost perfect conditions, except the burnt parts, but this only shows the difference between them. Without saying a word, Ro bumps into Tay hard and leaves, making him wonder why he is like that, but Kim thinks that he's just being moody again. In the autopsy room, the old man gets the news that the Roko brothers captured another creature of the same type, which comes as a surprise for him, just why are these creatures everywhere? From this one, he manages to pull the parasite out, before it can switch hosts. At school, the bell eventually rings, and everyone gets up to go home, but Cho invites Seijin to an eating spot as they haven't been to one in a long time. She agrees, and they eventually find a spot that suits their needs. But Seijin is quite confused by Sun's presence here. Are they dating or something? Sun tells her to mind her own business, and Cho becomes flustered as he was just hungry. They start staring down at each other, creating an atmosphere that even Cho can feel, as it's quite tense. After the meat is eventually done, they start eating, and after having a nice meal, they get some drinks and start walking around town while Seijin and Cho talk about various things, looking like nothing ever happened and life has just gone back to normal. However, when Seijin gets a phone notification, her entire mood changes and she says that the teacher called her back to school. But Cho says that it's fine, as she had a lot of fun hanging out. They say their goodbyes to each other, but Sun just looks at her, knowing full well how dangerous she has become. As they walk back home, Cho notes that Seijin is much cheerier than before, so they should do this again tomorrow to cheer her up even more. Sun agrees, but that's when Cho remembers that she forgot to give Seijin the history handout that they were supposed to turn in tomorrow, so she should go ahead and bring it to her. She tries to leave, but Sun suddenly grabs her arm and says that she shouldn't go. Seijin naturally isn't going back to school, as she was actually messaged by her next victim, who doesn't know that he will become her meal. Sun tells Cho that she was just discharged from the hospital, so he is sure that the teacher will understand and make an exception for her. They should just go home together. Cho, with a deep blush in her face, agrees. While walking home, Su Young and his friend notice that Seijin is getting in the car of some man, with his friend thinking that he is her father, who seems to be rather cherry. Su Young tells his friend that he is too pure for this world, and in the first place, that girl doesn't have a dad, never had one, but this sight gave him all of the information that he needed to know. She screwed up bad. When night arrives, Yejin decides to go out to town as she wants to try out the club that she and Sun got invited to. But maybe she didn't think things through, as clubs usually check people's IDs, right? She eventually arrives at the Six Shot Club, 
but she thinks that she won't ever be able to enter. As the line extends out to the road, just what are people waiting for? She starts messaging Sun to come, but he refuses, as he is eating, so he is currently unavailable. She laments having to leave only because of Sun's stupid gut, but that's when a man asks her if this is her first time here, a man that she recognizes all too well. He notes that her voice is quite similar. Have they seen each other somewhere else before? But he would have remembered her though. Naturally, this is Zigana, or his human name, Park. Because of this, Yejin thinks that she is extremely screwed right now. Without much thinking, Zagana invites her inside, and even if she tries to refuse him, he insists and insists, until eventually he gets her inside, where everyone appears to be having a good time, and there are tons of sparkling lights, something which attracts her greatly. Zagana asks what she thinks of this place, but she is too busy trying to touch the light sources, because she is a moth after all and moths are very attracted to light. He asks her what she's suddenly doing, but even if she wants to grab all of the lights, she knows that this isn't the time to be doing that. So she returns back to normal, and says that the atmosphere around this place is quite nice, much better than most clubs. Zigana says that it's easy for the atmosphere to come to life in these kinds of places, as people are here to have fun and forget about their worries. Yejin does like the constant lights and the atmosphere, but this is only a superficial place. To get more information about the insectors, she needs to go all out and show him that card. She pulls it out of her jacket and notes that she was actually invited to this place, which makes Zigana's eyes glow red, as she is a guest, but not from this side, from the other side. So they should go ahead and enjoy their time properly, not like these humans do. They start walking down and eventually arrive in a corridor where a gigantic elevator is. Yejin asks why it's so large and Zagana explains that this place is only for VIPs so it should accommodate any and all types of insectors, be it small or large. Yejin notes that it's certainly a VIP place, as this elevator might be bigger than her room. Zagana notes that not everyone can get their hands on these invitations. She must have some connection to their boss, right? She says that she's on the noticeable side, which makes him ask what she will be after she awakens. Butterfly? Perhaps even a mantis? She says that she will only be a common beetle, which makes him say that he is already an American giant water strider. But her being a beetle? is very unexpected. Eventually, the elevator stops, with Zigana noting that the boss will be very happy when he sees her, as they are probably friends for her to receive the invitation. Once the elevator doors swing open, Ye Jin is met with the sight of a fight to the death arena, where insectors and humans alike are betting to see who will win in the pit. The humans that are in the pit eventually overpower the insector and start stabbing him constantly to show that they were victorious. This is lawless heaven and earth. Suddenly, a gigantic Goliath beetle appears, named Jack, who crushes the three humans under her foot with ease, making the crowd cheer even more, their eyes filled with malice and a sadistic feeling. Yejin didn't expect something like this at all. A battle royale like this, between humans and insects with bedding? She could have never imagined that there was ever such a place in the entire world. This, all of this, is too disgusting to even look at. Zagana notes that the enormous beetle is called Queen Jack. She is the star of this palace. As with her strength and size, she is a match for most species, with a few exceptions naturally. One of those exceptions punches her straight in the gut, an insector called Red, which the public seems to hate, as he always finishes his fights way too fast. Ye Jin finds this too sadistic. Is there even any meaning to this constant violence? Zagana explains that there is, as this gives humans excitement and some even pleasure, while the insectors gain honor from it. Ye Jin wonders what he means by honor, so he notes that they basically gain the envy of all insectors, the opportunity to become one of the celestial insectors. However, that's just an opportunity, as being strong enough is the half of it. They must also match ideologies. Yejin thinks that this means that this guy also became a celestial through this ugly process. Zagana notes that there is another way to become a celestial insector. Is she interested? He hands her a parasite. But before he can explain how it works, Someone interrupts him and notes that the boss is looking for him. With this opportunity, Ye Jin gets back in the elevator and closes it, noting that she has to go to the bathroom urgently. After the elevator doors close, she slumps over the wall, thinking that she will give Sun the beating of his life for not coming with her tonight. Zagana notes that he screwed things up with her it seems, but the insector who interrupted him insists he visit the boss already. Due to this, Zagana cuts his head off and notes that he's going. The next day, when Ye Jin arrives at school, she immediately tries to hit Song, who just dodges all of her attacks as he is eating. But after she gets tired, she notes that she has some very nice information for him, so he should look forward to it. 
That's when they both feel that the atmosphere around the class has changed quite a bit. And sure enough, when Cho and Seijin arrive in the class, everyone starts looking at her and whispering about what she has done. Cho doesn't get it, so she asks what's wrong. But that's when she hears someone say that even if she is a trainee, it's still far too much for her to be involved with an older man like that. Cho just doesn't get what they are talking about. And Yejin notes that something about the atmosphere feels strange, like something is amiss. But this school never had a quiet day before, so it's probably just that. As Sun continues eating his sticks, Cho tells Seijin that they should just skip class and go somewhere else. But Su Young stops them and notes that he won't let them go anywhere until she finds out what kind of girl her friend is. Yesterday, his friend said that Seijin got into a luxury car with an older man, who he thought was her father, but he denied it, as Seijin doesn't have a father. So just who did she get into a car with? He was naturally worried for her safety, since they are classmates, so he took a taxi and followed them. Unfortunately, he then saw where they were going, so it seems that the downfall of the girl who wanted to become an idol is really just too pathetic. So her blaming him for not becoming an idol is actually really selfish of her, as she was never going to succeed from the start, judging by how she acts now. Yejin notes that she should go over there and teach that bastard another lesson, but Sun notes that he should be the one to do it. As he feels that unstable energy again, things are about to become really dangerous. Cho tries to hit Su Young once again, but Seijin stops her and tells her to leave, as she will be the one to take care of him this time, for good. With that she closes the door, as Su Young says that if that girl hit him again, he would have reported her to the violence committee. Suddenly, Seijin starts laughing maniacally, as she wanted to enjoy her school days a little bit longer, but it seems that something like that isn't possible. Su Young's friend notes that he will go and mess with her next, so he apologizes for his dumbass friend, as he doesn't know how to talk. But he also inquires about her services, as he makes a lot of money from deliveries these days. That's when Seijin begins transforming into an insector. Both Ye Jin and Sun are now on full alert, and Seijin smacks Su Young's friend out of the way, knocking him out as she does so. The classmates naturally start to run out of the classroom, but before any of them can get out, Seijin stretches out her hand and throws the tables and chairs at the door. With one of the chairs even going through the door, they are all scared for their lives, with Ye Jin asking what they should do. But Sun notes that there are far too many people watching. They can't transform here. Seijin tells Su Young to come out, which he reluctantly does. So Seijin grabs him by the neck, making him drop down the phone he was carrying. She tells him that this is all of his fault. Her dreams were crushed and she ended up like this only because of him and his dirty actions. Everything that has happened is his fault, even this. But now, he will repent, with his own life. Before her attack can reach him, Sun tells her to stop, as how will she face Cho after doing such a thing? What is she going to say after she sees that she killed him? Cho is now knocking at the door constantly, demanding that she open the door. Su Young begs the others to report this damn insector already, as they will all die because of her. But everyone sits in silence, not doing anything. So he calls them a bunch of useless bystanders and starts to beg Sun to report her. As this bug bastard will certainly kill him, he should pick up the phone and call the bug reapers already. Seijin starts speaking with Sun, noting that this is not going to work out after all, and she also asks for his help. She slams Su Young into the wall and tells him to listen closely. Everything that has happened, the actions he took without a second thought, the fame that he got while she suffered constantly in that dimly lit hospital room, and the heartless words that came out of his mouth recently make her not feel a single ounce of guilt if she were to kill him today, as all of it is entirely his own fault. Seijin reaches into her bag and notes that she will never be satisfied with just ending his life, so she will have to make him feel the same pain that she felt, over and over again. Sun is quite puzzled by what she pulled out, but Ye Jin seems to recognize the parasite. Seijin forcefully opens Su Young's mouth and says that in the middle of his pain, right when he is the most miserable he has ever been, she will take his life, and he will thank her for it. Su Young screams at her to get away, again and again, but nobody is listening to him, so the parasites that Seijin held now all fall into his mouth, and she forces him to swallow them while smiling. After doing just that, Su Young starts to convulse all around, with his body starting to twist and turn as it transforms, his whole appearance changing into that of an insector. Everyone looks at this with shocked expressions, but Ye Jin finally remembers where she saw that parasite. She was offered one from that guy. So this is what that thing was for? Disgusting. As Seijin has returned to her human form, she sits on the window and asks how it feels to become the very thing he despised most. To him, who is literally no different than a measly lying bug, 
there might actually be no difference considering. Quite expectedly, a teacher comes around and screams at them to open the door, with Cho becoming increasingly worried about what is happening inside. Seijin tells Sun to say hello to Cho for her, but then she decides otherwise, as she never wants to see her ever again. Now, she despises humans and everything that they stand for. With a final goodbye, she jumps out of the window and disappears, just in time for the teacher to manage to open the door and to see the newly transformed Su Young, who is still in pain because of what happened. His friend, who also just woke up, notices who that insector is and immediately pulls out his phone to call the Bug Reapers, as now it's his time to become a brave citizen. It was about time he was going to pass on the torch anyway. Before he can, however, Cho pulls his phone and says that he shouldn't do it, but he says that there's no other choice. It's either this or they will be eaten by that thing. As they bicker for the phone, it manages to slip from both of their hands and falls right next to Su Young, just in time for the Bug Reaper call to go through. The words coming out of the phone seem to trigger something in Su Young, as he regains his composure and looks in the window, wondering if this is real or a dream. But no, that can't be him. This isn't him. As he breaks the window, shattered glass falls all around and he starts wailing his tail around, with Ye Jin and Sun rescuing people like Cho from his thoughtless attacks. He continues that this cannot be happening. Him a bug. Never. He removes the windows entirely as he runs out, knowing that he has to until the Bug Reapers get here. He notes, however, that he will not die. He will do everything in his power to survive. He will survive and have his revenge. Back in class, Sun notices that Cho is extremely hurt by what happened, but he doesn't have time to comfort her, as he and Ye Jin give each other knowing looks. They choose to get out of the classroom, and Ye Jin explains that Sai Jin is probably somehow involved with that Zigana person as the parasite that she gave to Su Young is the exact same thing she received from him at the Six Shot Club. He explained that this is another way to become an insector, or something similar. If that is the case, they need to follow. They both say at the same time that they attached something to Seijin. One planted an ant, the other a thread. With that new bit of information they go even faster, as they can locate her instantly. Eventually, they manage to track her down under a bridge, where she seems to be crying. They both choose to come forwards, and Yejin asks her to stop for a second, as she wants to ask her something. That's when the woman who transformed her asks if they made her cry, but she doesn't even let Seijin answer, as she says that she hates one thing the most in this world, and that is when someone touches something that's hers. So how did they dare to touch her precious Seijin? Yejin notes that they have no clue what she is talking about. They just want to discuss something privately with her and leave. That's it. Seijin tells Hannah to not do anything too harsh, but in that moment she disappears completely, and jumps out at both Ye Jin and Sun, managing to hit Sun with her leg and afterwards throws a punch, but halfway through notices that Ye Jin is rather handsome, so she goes behind her and starts sucking her ear. Um, I'm sorry this scene just confused me so hard. Ye Jin naturally removes her, but it seems that Hannah has now discovered that she is an insector, something which she didn't expect. Ye Jin transforms into her bug form and attacks Hannah while noting that sucking someone's ear like that is extremely strange. Hannah notices that she's a silkworm, which isn't bad, but this only means that the boy that was to her is also an insector. Sure enough, Sun jumps at her mid-transformation and tries to hit her, but she moves swiftly and dodges his attack completely, saying that his clumsy way of moving will never catch her, since disappearing in front of his very eyes is somewhat of her specialty. Yejin asks what they should do, as they can't even reach her with their attacks but Sun notes that they should try that thing once more. While they talk, Seijin is amazed, as she didn't know that Ye Jin and Sun were both insectors. After they formulate their attack, Sun charges in with his powered-up fist, which makes Hannah think that they are about to try another useless attack. But when she tries to go back, she feels a cutting sensation on her neck, as Ye Jin has used a technique called Shining Star to completely surround her with silk, blocking out all escape. She gets mad at this, but Sun's attack manages to hit, although she blocked it with her transformed hand, which has an enlarged needle in it. Using this opportunity, she stabs Sun straight in the chest and starts to suck out his blood, but that's when she notices that his blood is red. Is he not an insector or something? Ye Jin tries to go and help Sun from his predicament, but Hannah just transforms her other hand and uses her surprisingly long needle to stab her in the shoulder, which doesn't seem to affect her at all, but as Hannah licks her blood off her needle, the places where the both of them were stabbed start to enlarge, and once Hannah activates her explosion ability, they both explode in their respective places, leaving them tired and quite injured. Hannah is shocked to see that they are tired just from this, as she was just barely getting started, 
This isn't nearly as over as they think it is. Before she can do anything, however, Seijin jumps in front of her and says that these two people are actually customers. They wanted to know about their goods, so she told them to come here. Hannah asks her if that's true, and stares deep into her eyes, but finds no hesitation in them. So she takes that as a fact, and notes that she should have just told her earlier, as she would have killed them if she didn't. Well, it's fine anyway. Unfortunately, she only has one product left, so she doesn't know how to split it. Sun notes that he doesn't need one right now, he just wants to know how it works, as he heard that it's something pretty interesting. Hannah is surprised that he hasn't heard the explanation yet, as this thing is quite popular in insector groups nowadays, but she will explain it to him. This is a type of special medicine, if you will, that can give insectors pretty strong powers if they were to consume it. However, for humans, it's rather different, as once a human eats it, it will turn into a mutant larva, and if they as insectors consume that larva fully, the effect will be doubled, compared to just consuming the medicine. Yejin doesn't know what to make of this at first, but Hannah notices two joggers coming around, so she says that it would be better to just show them, as people learn much better when they see it in practice. She stops the joggers with one thinking that this is a what song you listening to video, as he says the thing he is listening to, but Hannah just pops the parasite in his mouth, and he starts to convulse as he transforms, with his transformation being much more quick, as he transforms into a full larva almost immediately. Ye Jin can't believe she is seeing this disgusting sight once again. Hannah explains that they should think of this as a gift for what she did earlier. If they eat this, they will get stronger than before, so they should enjoy it, and if they want more and more of it, they should ask for Hanat at the Six Shot Club, as she will be glad to do business with them. Seijin looks at them before leaving, with Ye Jin asking Sun what they should do, but Sun moves to attack the larva that was about to eat the other human, and smashes it into the ground. He starts to rip it apart and try to eat it with his ants, but Ye Jin tells him to stop it, as he is really going to try and eat something so disgusting and vile. Seriously, he should come to his senses, as something like this is not right. Wasn't he against eating humans? Sun says that this is only a test, so he sends his ants to eat it. Sun just looks at his ants as they eat, with the other jogger wondering what the hell is going on. Yejin tells him that he's going too far. That thing was a perfectly normal human being just a few moments ago. He says that it isn't anymore, which makes her call him a bastard, as she thought he was different. But he is just like the other insectors, vying only for power and not caring for anything else. Sun just tells her to watch silently, as it will all make sense soon. Sure enough, the once larva-like insector starts to turn back into normal, surprising Yejin quite a bit. Sun explains that he has had this uneasy feeling about this existence ever since he felt it in Seijin. The unstable energy actually comes from the parasite that was deep within her body. So if he removes it from this guy, everything should be fine. The parasite makes its way out of the man as it's relentlessly assaulted by the ants, who start ripping it apart bit by bit. Yejin asks if it's okay for them to eat it. Won't that just affect him? Sun notes that they will find that out once they come back inside. He calls them to return and as the parasite parts start to enter his system, he starts tweaking out, and he can barely tell Yejin to stand back. The hole in his neck starts to convulse and grow, as he starts screaming out in pain. At the Six Shot Club, someone tells the boss that Hannah is here, so he lets her inside, which she is mad about, as since when does she need permission to come in, huh? She is also accompanied by Seijin. The boss, the burly man named Kong, says that this is only natural, as this place is his business after all. But Hannah feels like she deserves to be treated like a boss, too. He shouldn't act so cheeky, as they are equals. This isn't a hierarchy. It's not what they agreed on. As she has a swing of some champagne, Khan notices that her arms are bandaged up. So he asks what up with them. Did she perhaps have a fight? Hannah notes that it was while she was working, because of some feisty insectors that didn't know how to speak properly. Kong notes that even so, that is a bit much. But if she likes fighting, maybe she should go and promote the lawless land for a bit. Hannah asks why, and Kong explains that there is a new guy in there that has been causing them a heap of trouble, and their manpower has become ever shorter as time went on. Hannah says that it's not her problem, as it was his idea to start that side of the business in the first place. Kong notes that she seems to be in a bit of a hurry, but she should know that yesterday someone stole a large amount of pills, 50 of them to be exact. Hannah asks how that could ever happen. Did they get robbed? Kong says that nobody would be dumb enough to steal from them, except of course somebody who was working for them already. As he gets up, he instantly charges Seijin and notes that she is the culprit. The impact is so powerful that some glass breaks on the other side of the wall. Kong asks her, how dare she steal medicine from him? She is just a pet dog, 
but it seems that her master hasn't instilled fear into her yet, so he will chew her up and spit her out again and again, until there is nothing left of her sorry self. Hannah instantly gets on top of him, but Kong's bodyguards immediately put their blades at her neck, creating a standoff-like scene. Hannah tells him that he must already know what happens when someone touches her stuff, but Kong notes that the pills were his in the first place, so he has every right to do this. He asks Seijin where his pills are while he starts crushing her head, but even as Hannah stabs him he doesn't stop, seeming like nothing will stop him from finding the answer. Seijin can't bear the pain anymore, so she tells him that the pills are inside of Su Young, the bastard who made her in this way. She fed them to him in order to get revenge. Kong laughs, as he already knew what she did with the pills, but he expected a more fun answer from her honestly. Seijin is shocked when she hears this. Kong finally lets her go, with Hannah immediately jumping to her side, asking if she's alright. Kong starts laughing out loud, as how did she ever think of such a dumb idea? Like master like pet it seems, eh? Both Hannah and Seijin are surprised that he knew, with Hannah calling him a rat bastard for it. Kong says that it was simple to just have Seijin followed and monitored after he found out about what she did, but the thing that ate all 50 of the pills, he will be the one to eat it, and nobody else. Somewhere else, a group of bug reapers are hunting down Su Young, who is running for his life. They get him eventually, and before he can retaliate, Pio cuts his neck. Not enough to kill him, but enough to put him to sleep. He orders his men to capture it, but suddenly they start sinking into the ground. It seems that this is the doing of an insector that tells Zagana that they should finish this quickly. Pio, who is brandishing his labeled katana, makes Zagana wonder who that bastard is as he just sheathed his katana and is now just smoking. Did he just give up the fight? The other bug reapers are slowly being buried in the dirt, with them asking Pio for help, as this is not the time to just take things easy like that. Pio wonders what kind of creature they are protecting, as it doesn't seem to be like the other larvas they killed, but he will find out once he cuts it open. The insector who is making the ground sinkable is getting mad at Pio for just standing there like he's a big deal. But as the bug reapers scream out for help, Pio gets into position, and before they can even wonder what he's going to do, he zaps the other insector, incapacitating it for the time being. Zigana immediately starts transforming, just in time for him to be able to block the next attack that Pio had charged up, but it still manages to get him, because it's pure electricity. The other bug reapers stop sinking into the ground and Pio charges in, telling them to retrieve the larva at any costs, as that is their primary target. Thus, he starts trading blows with Zigana. He is extremely mad at this human, as all he knows how to do is play his petty tricks, his arrogance truly knows no bounds. He starts using two swords to attack Pio, asking if these are too much for a lousy human like him. He continues to attack Pio, with an attack eventually going through. But Pio inhales all of his cigarette all at once, and unleashes it on Zagana, who finds his attitude even more annoying. But this proves to be useful, as Pio has completely disappeared from his eyes. Before he can even react, Pio ends up behind him and strikes him fully with the sword, but this isn't enough to take down Zagana, as he still stands. Pio promises to take him in along with that larva, as they will all be quite useful test subjects. That's when he feels the ground beneath him shake, and he jumps away but this isn't enough to stop the underground attack. Fortunately, his subordinates protect him from the needles. But unfortunately, another surprise attack comes right after that one, and it drags the bug reaper straight into the sand, without a single chance of survival for him. The ground continues to fluctuate and burrow as Zagana asks if he's done with playing dead like that. As the insector slowly gets up from the ground, he asks who that glasses bastard is, as what he did is unforgivable. This specific insector is an antlion, a species that digs deep into the ground and waits for the perfect opportunity to strike. He notes that they don't have any time to play right now. They need to take the larva and bolt out of here, with Zagana agreeing. But he is reluctant to go back to the club with unfinished business. Pio overhears him saying this, and the bug reapers all rush to catch him, but they can't because of the antlion. Pio also tries to use his katana in order to strike again, but it's out of juice. To stop their incessant advance, the antlion uses a large area of attack in order to close off the area and block the incoming bug reapers. Pio tells the others to retreat as he charges in, with Zigana noticing how annoyingly tenacious he can be. The antlion congratulates him for his bravado, so as a reward, he can have this bastard, but he promises, when they see each other again, he will rip him into pieces and eat him slowly. With that, both him Zagana and the larva disappear out of the area. But this wasn't all for nothing, as Pio has gained a new bit of information, and now has plans to scour all of the clubs in the vicinity. It's time for them to turn the tables around, 
and it's time for the hunted to become the hunters. In the dead of night, when everyone has gone to sleep, an insector runs away with all of his might from Sun, who seems to be hunting him down for food. The insector tries to plead with him, as they are both hunters, but that's when another Sun pops up behind him, and they slowly start to approach him as he continues to panic. Before he can even think of even doing anything, he is crushed under their combined might and left to be eaten by the ants. At school, nobody seems to be that sad at Su Young transforming into a monster, with his friend not even caring, as two of his teeth are missing and need to be replaced. Everyone has moved on, basically. Cho overhears a few girls talking about Seijin, calling her a monster, which she makes them apologize for, as she's her precious friend, not a monster, as they called her. Yejin is quite surprised at how fast this girl speaks her mind to other people, and also asks if she's okay, which she confirms, but she most definitely isn't. Cho notes that she was in the classroom when that incident took place, so she saw Saijin, but was she really a monster? Yejin explains that her friend did no harm to anyone except Su Young, so no, she wouldn't consider her a monster, per se. Cho is happy to hear that, as she was afraid when she heard what was happening inside of the class and she couldn't look through the windows, but Seijin really became an insector. She starts crying her eyes out, as she thinks that she will never have her friend back. But Yejin knows that there is a way, a way made by Sun. In an abandoned building, Sun continues to feast on the insector he hunted down at night, but it's not actually Sun, as he is just sitting there, watching his ants eat. This is because after he consumed the larva, the number of ants in his body increased, to the point where they were overflowing from him. So after repeated failed attempts, he managed to create a swarm, which hunts for him automatically, without him doing much. But these ants are still the same, as when they don't get full enough, they will inevitably attack. Thankfully, he also became stronger, so he takes care of them quite easily, and puts them in their places. After he does just that, he suddenly feels the presence of some insectors, three to be exact. So he thinks that this is the perfect opportunity for him to test out his new power. He transforms into his ant form as he falls and starts sprinting towards the area where he felt the commotion. But as he gets closer, the energy he feels decreases, almost as if one of them just perished. So he gets even closer and listens to the commotion. Another insector is calling Red, the insector from the arena, a bastard, as he lured them all of the way here. For something petty like this? Red notes that he is correct. He just wanted to beat them up pretty bad, but because of management he wasn't able to do it properly in the matches so they will be his punching bag for today. Red is also revealed to be a ladybug. He tells the other insector to get into his fighting position, which makes him matter, as his arrogance is too much to just be left alone. Has he really lost his mind after picking so many fights in the lawless land or something? This is the rhinoceros beetle insector, Bera. He charges Red with his horn ready to end him, but he just dodges and notes that he really messed up this time. Did he just think that he would have the advantage in this fight only because he has a metallic body? As Bera charges him once again, Red sidesteps and punches him straight in his gut, with the attack going through him completely ending him on the spot. With his fist full of insector blood, Red tells Sun to come over here and go around, since he seems to be interested in what he's doing. Because of this, Sun gets out of hiding and accepts his invitation, as this is what he came for in the first place. The constant driving of cars on the bridge they are fighting under seems to hurt the damaged parts of the bridge more and more, seeming like it won't last much longer. Red notes that he looks quite ferocious, so he asks for his name, but Sun doesn't say anything, which puzzles Red, as he would have at least wanted to know the name of the person he is about to kill. Red throws a light jab in his face as he approaches, and demands for his name once again, but Sun stops the attack with his abundance of ants and says that his name is Black Ant, but unfortunately that will be the last thing he will hear before he dies. Red starts to laugh out loud, as he must be that guy, the person who said that he would personally destroy Zagana. He has been itching to have a one-on-one -on -one fight with him since he heard that he acts like that. Red throws another punch in Sun's direction, which turns in a multitude of punches, but Sun dodges every single one which angers Red, as he thinks that he's trying to just test his skills, so he chooses to throw a heavy punch to make him attack. This does make him dodge and attack him with a charged up punch, with Red thinking that it will be very light, but the second he is hit by it in the chin, his lights are turned off. The bridge crack starts to show more and more, as even on the surface, it is pretty visible. Red slowly wakes up from his dazed state, wondering what that was, as he could see that punch coming as clear as day. But its speed combined with that power, that's something that shattered his expectations completely. This bastard truly is pretty strong. Sun suddenly asks for his name, as he should at least tell him his name before he kills him. Red notices that this is just a mockery of what he said earlier, 
so he puts his fists together and starts using an ability, making Sun try to throw a punch before he can do anything. But he is too late, as Red has already activated his ability. He curses at Sun, as he didn't want to use this at all, but he can't win otherwise. He uses his reflector ability to send Sun flying away, but unfortunately this pushback is also enough for the bridge to openly crack as a bus full of people drives on it. Sun and Red take the fight outside with both of them exchanging blows, but when the bus starts to fall down, Sun notices and uses his ants to create another suit of armor as he uses all of his speed to reach the bus in time. He does just that and holds the bus in place as long as he can in order for it to not fall, but that's when Red calls him an insolent bastard as he really thought that he could just stop someone like him with a trick like this one. He throws the ants that he caught away, but instead of taking down Sun when he's vulnerable, he takes a hold of the bus too, and they both put it on the ground in a soft manner. The people inside get out, and Sun and Red stare at each other, with Red saying that he is a fool for turning his back on his opponent, that will certainly lead to his death one day. However now, it's time for their second round. As Red charges in, Sun just sighs, deflects his attack and slaps him so hard his armor breaks off. With that, Sun has achieved total victory against Red, who can only accept his defeat. But just as the ants try to consume him, Sun decides to throw him away, with his reason unknown to anyone. As he walks away, Sun promises to one day have a rematch, as he will not let this be, not in the slightest. As the sky turns gray, Cho is called by her mother, who asks where she is, with her replying that she's only taking a short walk. Her mother doesn't believe it, however, as she knows that every day after school, she is looking for Seijin. Cho tells her that even if she wants to find her, it isn't that easy. She really did just go for a calming walk. The mother yells at her to come home as she will end up the same way that girl did if she keeps this up and closes the call instantly, with Cho sighing at her mother's attitude. Suddenly, a person who we know as the Antlion asks her if she's talking about Bang Seijin. His human name is Young Gaio. Is she perhaps her friend? He decides to take her to a dark forest, where as they walk, Cho asks if he knows where Seijin is. He replies with yes, making her ask how he knows of her. Gaio tries to say that he's an insector at first, but stops himself and notes that he's her senior. Cho guesses that he must have said insector senior, but she isn't really surprised by it and asks if Saiyajin has been doing well these days. Gyo confirms that she is, as Hana has stuck to her and will not let go, almost like a tumor. Cho thinks that this means that she's been doing well, so she tries to excuse herself out of the conversation as she doesn't want to bother him anymore. It also seems like she made some pretty good friends, so she is relieved to hear it. Gaio laughs at the notion of him being her friend, it's embarrassing even. The reason he walked her to this place is because he was hungry and he wanted to eat some human. But if Seijin finds out that he ate her, the expression on her face when she finds out will be to die for. Cho slowly backs away, while Gyo explains that he never liked that little worm, as he fought for his life while eating whatever he could, until he finally found his identity as an antlion and prospered. However, Seijin doesn't have that, as because of Hannah she is living a comfortable life, something which is disgusting. He notices how surprised she is, but says that she shouldn't be, but well it would be hard for a human to understand all of this. Cho tries to run away, with Gaio saying that it's too late, as she stepped into his territory. Cho is dragged into the ground as it becomes soft, with the larva getting ready to feast on her flesh. Before they can reach her, however, a thread of silk cuts them in half, as Yejin has appeared to save her and immediately attacks Gaio as she descends, while also pulling Cho out of the ground. Gaio asks who she is, with her noting that a bastard of an old man used to call her Silky, so they should go with that. She lets Cho down on solid ground and tells her to run away, as this has nothing to do with her anymore. Cho thanks her, and does just that, with the larva choosing to attack Ye Jin to appease their hunger. Unfortunately for them, she is much more powerful than them, so she easily cuts them up into tiny pieces, their blood splashing all around. Gaio asks why she's doing something like this. What does she have to do with his hunt? Does she just want to get buried now? Ye Jin finds his threats cute, but while listening to his yapping, she notices that he is similar to the larva, but at the same time different. Is he perhaps a part of the celestial insectors? Gaio confirms it and says that if she is this knowledgeable, it must be that she was one of the ones who took down Zagana. But they were too. Will she be okay with just her? Ye Jin agrees that she's not ready to fight celestial insectors alone, but she has a trick up her sleeve. She has no choice now but to use the power of this thing. Gyo notices that she has a parasite, so he screams at her to put that thing down. She isn't deserving of it. Ye Jin immediately pops it in her mouth, with Gyo trying to kill her before she even swallows. 
which appears to have worked, as he can't see her because of the dust. He thinks that he was worried for nothing, but that's when Ye Jin cuts all of his pincers in one swift blow, wondering where the hell she got her power from. Was she not a larva this whole time? Ye Jin notes that he will never get to know the power of true insectors, with her hair being super long and sharp. As Ye Jin prepares to attack once again, Gyo asks what she means by true power. Does she mean that he's a fake? Before he can even react, Ye Jin cuts both of his hands off. With him still insisting that he is not a fake, he has been recognized by the boss himself. He is the only one who has. He tries to grab Ye Jin's neck with his parasite tongue, but she tells him to just stop, as her skin has now been woven with steel threads. A weak attack like that won't even leave a scratch on her body. She grabs the parasite tongue and says that this mistake will be his undoing. As she puts thread all over his tongue, he wonders if what she said was true. Is there really a difference between their races? But no, that cannot be possible. He will never accept it. He dives deep into the ground, leaving Ye Jin with his tongue in her hand. As Gaio digs deep underground, he promises to one day have his revenge. He is not running away. He will grow stronger and stronger until she won't be able to compete with him. Unfortunately for him, Ye Jin's threat surrounds him even in the underground, and with one measly pull, she makes him into minced meat, ending his life in a second. She thinks that this power is amazing, as she finally took down a celestial. Her plan is finally coming to fruition after all of this time. Suddenly, Zigana appears out of nowhere and says that it's time for round two to start, as that fight won't satisfy her, right? Ye Jin is shocked to see him here, but perhaps with her new improved abilities, she might be able to take him down. Zagana says that he knew that he saw her somewhere. She was with that ant bastard, but where is he now? He can still feel the ants that he put inside of him, something that won't be fixed if he doesn't kill that bastard. Ye Jin says that this is fortunate then, as she will personally take care of his pain, for good. As she attacks, Zagana tells her to go ahead and try, as this is all that she can do. Unfortunately, this was all talk, as her attacks kept pushing him. If he slips up for as much as a second, he will die, because the drug power is just that strong. However, the duration is almost over. He continues surviving for one second, then two, then three, and at the fifth second, he stands still as he knows that this is over. In that second, Ye Jin falls to the ground as she attacks, with her hair disappearing and her power with it. That's when she remembers that Hannah told her the duration isn't great, she messed up really bad. Zagana puts his sword at her neck and tells her to come along quietly if she doesn't want to lose her neck, that is. Back at Sun's apartment, he and his grandma are watching a show about boxing, more specifically about the national treasure athlete, whose son recognizes as Red, who explains that he just got injured in a street fight against an insect, but not an insector, as even he can't fight something like that, right? As he continues watching, Sun gets a message from Cho, who asks when he's coming back to school. He thinks that it's too early for that as he isn't able to control the swarm just yet, but he also notices that she said Ye Jin also hasn't been coming to school. The homeroom teacher is livid because of this. Sun, curious about what she's been up to, messages her. Inside of the arena, Ye Jin is getting her snot beaten out of her, as the insectors are ganging up on her. Zagana watches this, and finally notices that she's that same chick that came with an invitation. How arrogant of her, truly. He notices that her purse is buzzing and is happy to see that the ant has finally shown himself through a message. Sun excuses himself to his bedroom and says that he won't be going to school tomorrow either. His grandma says that he can do whatever, since he already missed a week. As he goes into his room, he gets a message back from Ye Jin. A photo. Something that makes him gnarl. Ye Jin's mask, with the Six Shot Club invitation tucked in it. At the club, deep underground where the fighters are kept, Zigana goes up to Ye Jin's cell and asks if she's dead, because she certainly looks the part. Why is she so weak anyway? She's making customers angry for no reason. Ye Jin tells him to leave, as she doesn't have the energy to keep him entertained. Zagana notes that he really would have given her another pill to boost how she plays, but he can't, as some dumbass girl stole all of them and used them for nothing. However, the most important thing out of all of this, just what is her purpose with this? What does she want to achieve? Ye Jin notes that she's a bug exterminator, making him wonder if she's an idiot. If she wants to live a long life, she shouldn't relate herself to those bug reapers, but she should know that they are all the same. That's the reason why he spared her in the first place. He tells her that the next match will be soon, so she should rest while she can, as this will be a pretty special match. As the announcer enters the arena, he hypes everyone for this next match, as it's their main event. Ten people enter the ring, only one gets out, a race, or rather, battle royale, that will be nothing short of hell. This is the stick insector Jaja, the MC for Lawless Land. The first contender for this is also the protagonist of this event. 
then newcomer that everyone loves to beat on, Silky. An opponent will be added every minute, so if she can't get rid of them before the 60 second count, her chances of victory become slimmer and she will be eaten right here right now. With that introduction, it's time for the second player to enter. Yejin's opponent immediately charges her, showing that this will be a tough match for her. Inside one of the waiting cells, Red practices his punches, with Zagana appearing and asking if he's ready, as he's the tenth opponent. Red notes that he doesn't like that he's participating in this dumb game. He should have made him the star of the main event if he wanted him to participate. Zagana says that he is truly arrogant. If they did that, he would have killed the entire roster and ruined the business. Red throws a punch close to his face and says that he could beat him right now, even that Kong monkey that he calls boss. Zagana becomes increasingly madder, as he would have shown him what true power means right now, but he is a player, so he is safe, for now. Suddenly, Zagana gets a phone call, with one of the employees saying that the elevator to the VIP area has just disappeared entirely. Zagana closes the call and tells Red to get ready as his opponent has just appeared. Back in the arena, Jaja is amazed at how Yejin is doing as she has been dealing with enemies left and right, despite her injuries. Unfortunately for her, luck has run out, as Queen Jack has entered the arena and she is ready to smash things to bits. She catches Ye Jin by surprise and kicks her high in the air, allowing her to hit her even harder with a mighty punch that sends her flying. As she gasps for breath, three more opponents enter the arena, which might be considered unfair, but they must remember that this isn't called the Lawless Land for nothing. With this, they have reached the climax of the show, where Ye Jin will face the consequences of her actions. As the clock ticks one minute away again, Jaja tells the next opponent to get a move on already, as he can't have the audience waiting like this. Eventually, the next opponent arrives, but it's only his head, which is immediately crushed under Sun's foot, who seems to have eaten more than one insectors. Zigana looks at him and is amazed that he really dared to come here. Ye Jin can barely muster up enough strength to call out his name, but Jaja cannot allow unrestricted opponents to enter. He must be swiftly dealt with. He tries to hit Sun with a squashing punch, but he summons some green power using his ant colony and blasts Jaja's arm away with what seems to be actually acid. Sun notes that he will not say this twice so they should listen well. Where is Ye Jin? Sun charges up his acid and shoots another beam, which hits one of the opponents, who was actually close to Ye Jin. She can't help but wonder where he got such monstrous power from, but now there's no time to ask. She screams at him to stop shooting so recklessly, as he might even hit her. She starts making herself big, so that he can see her. But that's when Zagana descends onto the arena, and puts a blade at her neck, saying that he has been waiting for the ant to pop up for quite a while. Sun instantly tries to hit him with a beam, but Zagana asks him if that's wise, as he will make sure that he will be hitting them both. Sun can't do much of anything against that, so the other opponents charge in under Zagana's command, as they must kill that bastard no matter what. Sun rearranges his mask and says that this is really cliché. He starts blasting again, accurately hitting his shots with ease. He moves his aim down to Jack, who grabs one of the weaklings and throws him in the way of the shot, melting him right there and then. This gives Jack the opportunity to prepare a mighty attack, and she successfully lands it, presumably crushing Sun on the spot. Zagana is surprised that Jack actually managed to use her head for a bit, so he will reward her once she brings the ant's mangled corpse. Jack doesn't move, however making Zagana wonder what she's doing. Suddenly, Jack starts to convulse and melt as Sun blasts through her belly, her blood all on his armor as he walks out. Zagana can only wonder where he got such monstrous power from. Did he perhaps eat a larva too or something? Yejin is happy to see him victorious, but the public is not too happy that their fun is seemingly running out. Sun tells him to let go of that kid, as she's emergency food that he needs to be preserved. Zagana says that they are just kids that are playing too much, but that's when someone from the public screams at him as since he's the manager, he should give back the money they betted, as he betted 200 million on Jack. But he didn't expect a her to be killed by an uninvited guest. Zigana has had enough of these lowly humans ordering him around so he apologizes for the inconvenience. They will get their money back. But for now they need to shut up and keep on betting. This surprises the VIPs. But Sun doesn't even care as his vision is locked in on Zigana, who he promises to kill right now. Zagana tells him to not be so confident in himself, as his real opponent is right behind him. That's when Red welcomes him, as he has been waiting for him for a really long time. Sun asks if he's here for revenge, which he confirms, so they should stop talking and get to hitting each other already. Sun prepares to defend himself, but Red moves past him in a split and punches Zagana straight in the face, sending the bastard flying. He can barely stop himself using his sword, 
but this has angered him to no end. Sun asks Red why he did that, with him explaining that he saw everything from up above, and needless to say, it was moving, so they should go, as their friendship has impressed him to no end, and their rematch can wait. He should go and leave him to this, since they are friends. Sun wonders just what he's talking about as Ye Jin can barely hold in her laugh, but it's no time to joke as he picks her up and tells her to hold on to him as this will be a bumpy ride. He starts sprinting away, with her noting that she can't go outside like this and reveal her identity, but Sun tells her to shut up as they don't have the time for anything else. Zagana tells Red that all he does is create trouble, and he is done cleaning up after him every single time, he's not worth it anymore. Red tells him that he was the one that was keeping him alive all of this time because he was useful, but not anymore. Zagana says that his arrogance truly has no end, but unfortunately today will be his end. As Sun runs towards the elevator, Yejin asks how he got a keycard to get in this place, but Sun says that he didn't have one, he just broke in. Or rather, broke it. That's when Yejin notices that the entire elevator is just gone, with Yejin not even knowing what to expect anymore. As Sun climbs up the hole he made, Kong comes in with a sound-shattering punch and hits Sun straight in the face. He says that they will both take responsibility for the destruction of property and disruption of business. Since they don't have cash, he will have to take their lives instead. Earlier, Kong was getting ready to have the meal of his life, the 50-pill larva he cherished for all of this time. One of his girls asks if that man also knows of this thing, which he doesn't care about, as he's certainly not going to take away his food, since he's already at the top of the insector food chain. That guy probably can't even evolve anymore. With this, however, he might even grow stronger than him, so he should feast and become the apex of insectors. Before he could even take a bite, the whole club started to rumble, and an employee came inside telling him that there's an intruder. Kong asks if he's strong, with the employee saying that the VIP elevator was destroyed, and he's currently going to the Lawless Land Arena, so he is potentially pretty dangerous. Kong was surprised that someone managed to destroy that elevator. But so what? Is he ordering him to go deal with that intruder or something? The employee says that it's not that. It's just that they don't know of the intruder's power, so they need to be cautious. Kong crushes his weak skull with one finger, as he was too useless for him now. But well, he isn't mad about the interruption, as some pre-meal exercise will be quite nice. That's how he got to Sun, who is being held by his neck and is feeling genuine fear, something that he hasn't felt in a really long time. Kong notices his quivering and says that he shouldn't be scared as he will not eat him. He is here to have some fun. He punches Sun so hard he is sent into the wall and then continues with a kick. Kong urges him to show him his real strength. Is this really what he was called here for? He can't accept something like that. This is not enough for him. He needs to show his true power or he will die right now. That's when Sun's hive comes from behind and starts to wail on him with whatever it can, which Kong finds kinda cute but also pretty annoying. As he tries to punch it, however, Ye Jin stops his attack and wonders how this man can have so much strength in his human form, as even if she used all of her strings she wouldn't be able to hold him. Kong is surprised that they still have some fighting spirit. It's actually starting to piss him off, but this is exactly what he wanted. They should struggle for their lives, as this brings out their true powers. Back at the arena, Red looks pretty hurt, but Zagana looks worse, as he is on his last legs. He tells Red to not get cocky as this isn't over yet. But Red tells him that whatever he does, he won't be good enough to beat him. If he's truly that pissed, he should get up, as it's not in his nature to beat down on weaklings. That's when Kong throws Sun and Ye Jin into the arena through a wall, with Zagana being the most surprised to see his boss down here. He tries to apologize for this mess, but Kong screams at him to not be weak and apologize, as he is the subordinate of the great Kong. Red and the public are also surprised to see him, but Red wonders how powerful he is as he seems to have beaten that ant guy without much difficulty. Kong notes that he's hungry now since he stretched his body, so since they probably haven't eaten yet either, they should have a feast and make the public enjoy their time. He tells Zagana to go and activate the hatch, which he thinks that it's not a wise idea, but Kong notes that he doesn't like to say things twice, so he should open the damn hatch. He runs away and does just that, with a hatch that is above the arena slowly opening. Sun and Ye Jin wonder what this is, but that's when a human falls out of it. Kong tells them to not be shy and enjoy these treats as they are in the house. More and more humans start appearing that transform into larva. As Kong is indulging himself in some larva meat, he tells the others to dig in too. As the larva fully transforms, Ye Jin and Red think that this is truly horrible. But Sun thinks of this as a perfect opportunity. All they need to do is stop that guy from consuming any larva, as he will take care of the rest. Ye Jin wonders if that's possible 
but Red tells him that he does what he needs to without worry. Kong tells them to stop talking and enjoy the food, as this is not a chance that they will get again anytime soon. As he eats, he finds the small parasite, noting that this is the best part of the entire meal. Red notices that he grabbed it, and as Kong puts it in his mouth, Red charges in, ready to stop him. As he does that, Sun tells Ye Jin to run away, as he came to save her in the first place, so she should go. Ye Jin smiles, as she didn't believe he was the sentimental type, but he should stop talking nonsense and go and eat, as she will help Red with the fight. Sun agrees and tells the hive to come out and eat all of the larvae it can. The hive does just that, but Sun isn't finished yet, as he lets his other ants eat too, with all that is left of them being one hand's worth. As Red approaches, Kong bites his fist and tells him to stop pestering him like a flea while he's eating. He throws Red into the public but Ye Jin catches him with her silk and tells him to use it to jump back at that guy. He does just that and uses a barrier charge punch to stop Kong from eating. Afterwards he unleashes a deadly combo on him, using the silk to boost his power exponentially, to the point where he sends Kong back. Unfortunately this wasn't enough, as Kong has managed to consume the parasite, making its strength grow even further. He tightens all of his muscles as he punches the air, which Red defends himself of, something which proves to save him, as the sheer force of the punch would have knocked him out if he didn't have the barrier. Just how powerful can one man truly be? Kong says that he needs to finish his meal now, but Red tries to hit him once again in order to stop him. Before Ye Jin can tell him to back away, Kong punches him in the gut and kicks him away, destroying most of his armor as he does so and knocking him out. Ye Jin falls to her knees, as they cannot hope to win against such a monster, as he is far beyond anything they have seen up until now. Kong continues to eat until he gets to his fifth one, noting that this should be enough to fully revitalize him. That's when he notices that the larva he is holding is convulsing, and out of his mouth comes the parasite, which goes to Sun, as his ants carry it to him. With this final larva, Sun has eaten a total of ten, something which Kong is extremely mad about. He doesn't know how he did it, but he will consume him before he can even digest them. As he charges in, Sun calls all of his black ants back, with them forming colony upon colony, and his arm being transformed into a new shape. With that, he tells the newly formed colonies to consume that man, as he is their last target. As Sun stands with his army of colonies, Ye Jin is amazed, but Kong is surprised that he is actually using tricks. However, there are only 11 of him. This does not change a thing. Sun puts his hand forwards and tells his colonies to go ahead and devour, which they all go to do, with Kong being extremely hyped up, as finally he has a worthy opponent to fight. All of the colonies jump him at once, and at first he manages to hold them off, but they eventually pin him down, which makes him scream that he should show more strength, as just pushing him around with numbers is no fun. He smashes the ground which defeats some of the colonies, but the ants gather around another colony and create powerful hands for it which the colony smashes Kong with at full force. Kong is ecstatic, as this is what it means to have a real fight, when both sides struggle for survival. He uses his strength to smash both of the colonies that were holding him in place, but that's when he notices that it's not over yet, as two other colonies are preparing acid attacks, much larger than Sun previously did. With his command, the colonies both unleash a spray of acid that Kong can only laugh at, as he notices that there are others that are holding his feet down. This causes the acid attack to hit him fully, resulting in a pretty large green explosion at the end, which creates a lot of dust. Ye Jin wonders if it's truly over, which Sun also wonders, as he looks closely at the dust. But that's when his eyes widen, as a much bigger figure comes out of it. Kong announces that now, they will meet the real him, Ijeo, the Scarab Beetle. Sun is shocked to see that he actually managed to transform while he was hit, and Kong explains that he didn't expect him to force his awakening, he is truly amazing, so since he has taken quite a liking to him, he will make sure that he dies by his hands only. Sun commands his ranged colonies to attack once again, but as they attack, Kong unleashes one punch, which besides taking the colonies down, it also crumbles the wall behind Sun because of the sheer force. Seeing this, Sun tries to assemble his ants once again, but it's far too late, as Kong tackles him into the same wall that he crushed earlier. Ye Jin screams out for Sun, but she can't do anything to help him. As Kong keeps pushing and pushing, he asks Sun if this is all that ten larvae are really worth, as he is still a weak rat. He pushes him through the wall and smashes his head on the ground, presumably taking Sun out for good. Kong is sad that his toy has broken after such a short while of him playing with it, but whatever, this guy was a weakling anyways. As he died before even fighting properly, well at least now he can eat him and get those ten larvae back. Suddenly, 
The surprisingly conscious Sun mutters something under his breath, which makes Kong ask him to speak up. Sun says it again, eat me, swarm. At that moment, all of the colonies appear and they start to grab onto him with their mouths, damaging him as they do so. Kong notes that this is truly pathetic. Is he really going to take his own life like this? As Sun screams, the final swarm aims for his head, which it eventually engulfs. Slowly, Sun is completely covered by the swarm, which assumes a beastly shape as it howls out at the sky. Kong laughs as he sees this, wondering what this is, but it's whatever, as he has been dying to fight something more powerful. Above the normal arena, Zagana and one other insector notice that Sun and Kong have left the arena, but Zagana is more amazed that Kong actually awakened. Just how strong will that ant become? But this isn't the time to think about such things, as this situation has surely been reported to the higher-ups already, meaning that person will most certainly get here soon. The executive of the celestial insects, Hexagon. He tells the other insector to take all of the cash and run as far as possible. As six shots are done as of today, the insector asks what he will do, with Zagana noting that he will go down and check on the situation. But that's when a strange suited up man appears in front of him and asks to come with, as he is not used to this place and might not be able to find his way around, so he will rely on him for that. Is that fine? The Swarm and Kong continue to fight, with none of them seeming to take the upper hand, as they are both dealing blows to each other that would kill normal insectors. Eventually, Kong manages to deal an even heavier punch to the Swarm, which sends it back. But before Kong can relish in his victory, the Swarm shoots a beam at his face using its newly formed tail. He charges an even more powerful beam and lets it out on Kong, who defends himself with his shoulder, which is very armored. He says that this thing's attacks are rather simple, but his attacks are even simpler. With that, he charges in on the Swarm, which causes the acidic beam to go everywhere. It even goes outside and creates an explosion. Ye Jin is shocked to find out that Sun is still fighting, but they need to use this opportunity. She asks Red to get up already, who really wants to, but as he tries he starts coughing up blood, showing that he is in no position to move without assistance at least. The Swarm desperately tries to go through Kong's armor, but it can't seem to penetrate it, making Kong say that nobody can dare to stop him. Nobody. He punches the Swarm in its arm, making it just fall off. But this creates an opportunity for the Swarm to bite his other arm and try to slice it, but it seems that its attacks prove useless. Kong tells it that its efforts will be all in vain. Even if it struggles with everything that it's got, he will crush it under his foot. The Swarm screams out, but Kong just punches its neck off, making him think that it's over. Unfortunately for him, the swarm hangs on by just a thread and slowly recovers its hand and head, attaching them back to its body. Kong finds this disgusting, but fine. If it really wants to fight until there is nothing left of it, he will do so as many times as he needs to. As he tries to attack with his left fist, it gets slashed off completely, with tons of ants being inside of him and his flesh. Needless to say, he is shocked, as he can't believe that this thing actually managed to deal him such a blow. But this confusion soon turns into anger as nobody would even dare to think of doing such a thing to him. He starts punching with his right arm constantly, pushed by his undying thirst for revenge. But try as he might, he just can't get the swarm down completely. He feels that something is seriously wrong, as even if he punches it constantly and is never on the receiving end of the attacks. The more he breaks this thing, the more it feels like he's the one that's being devoured. He removes such delusions from himself, as he is the apex predator. He is the one who does the devouring around here. As he says that, both of his legs just fall off as they are sliced, making him scream out in rage as he will not let this measly creature try and devour him any longer. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't seem to have a say in this any longer, as he feels a strange sensation, pressure combined with tension. It's just like when he first met that man. This feeling, it's fear. In his last moments, he begs for forgiveness. But as the swarm's gaping mouth opens slowly, Sun, who is still there, answers with one word hungry. With that, the swarm starts to consume the now deceased Kong with great hunger, but it also screams out at its victory, as it has shown that it's the real apex predator. Ye Jin and Red eventually make it to where Sun is, where they see him standing above Kong's desecrated corpse, but Ye Jin feels that something is seriously wrong. As Sun slowly turns to them, it's shown that his eyes are blood red, and he only tells them that he is hungry. Sun says that he's starving, actually, with Ye Jin being very surprised that this guy actually smirked. But Red asks if this is really the only thing that she's surprised about right now. As his eyes are fully bloodshot, he seems that he has lost all sense of self. Before they even notice it, Sun moves closer to them, with Red screaming at Yejin to defend herself. But she was too surprised by all of this, so she does nothing as Sun grabs her by the neck 
and also grabs Sun with a colony to make sure that he doesn't move, something which Red isn't happy about. As Sun holds Ye Jin in place and smiles, she asks if it's really him behind those eyes, but Sun doesn't pay her any mind as he finally found something good to eat. That's when Red, who managed to get out of his restraint, punches him. This gives Ye Jin the opportunity to scream out at him as he needs to come back to his senses already. Red asks if this is the end of their tear-jerking friendship. It's quite disappointing. As they both hit him, he doesn't stop smiling and uses a new skill, corrosion, which makes the ants that are on his attackers start violently eating at their armor, eventually covering them up fully as they consume. Sun looks at this, but behind his crazy, blood-fueled eyes is the real Sun, who is being kept as a prisoner by the ants, who seem to be ready to end him for good. Sun, completely defeated by everything, tells them to go ahead and eat, as he has had enough of this world, he can't take it. They should eat up and get it over with already. The ant colonies start approaching him, but that's when a screech can be heard. And when Sun looks up, he sees the red ant once again, who menacingly stands above him. Sun wonders what it's doing here again, but he tells it to stop, as he has reached his limit too. This is more than enough. Suddenly, the red ant projects a humanoid appearance out of it, who tells Sun to continue on living. Sun is charmed by its appearance, but the other ants don't like it, as they are all slowly killed off by the sheer presence of the red ant's new form, with even Sun being pushed back a bit. The red ant tells him that it's absolutely necessary that he lives and starts pushing him out into the real world, which he tries to stop, as he has something to say to this red figure that seems all too similar, but he cannot. In the real world, Sun screams out as the ants stop attacking Ye Jin and Red, but Ye Jin is more worried about Sun, who is still screaming as he slowly transforms. Eventually, he fully gets out of his ant form and falls to the ground. But Ye Jin catches him and tells him to wake up while asking if he's okay. That's when Ye Jin feels something wet on her shoulder. That being Sun's tears, who finally remembered who the red figure looked like. His mother. Ye Jin doesn't know what to say at this point, as first he acts like a crazy bastard and then starts crying like a baby for his mother. Sun asks what happened to Kong, but she says that he needn't worry. Everything was resolved already. Red looks at them and notes that it seems their relationship is much more than a friendship, not that he's complaining or anything. Ye Jin throws Sun at him, telling to go ahead and carry him if he can only think about weird stuff. Now, all they need to do is get out of this place, which they try to do. But that's when the suited up man appears behind them and says that this is truly an annoying situation. Ye Jin wonders who he is, while Red wonders how they didn't see him. But that's when they notice that Zagana and the two bodyguard girls are also there. The suited man asks if this is their doing, with Red telling Ye Jin to step back and let him handle this situation, as he can feel that this guy is extremely dangerous. The man says that he wants to leave work early in order to experience the nightlife of the town, so he would appreciate their cooperation. Before the man can ask them what he wants to ask, Zagana asks how they dared to touch his boss and charges in with the bodyguards, as they can pay for this crime with their own lives. The suited man sighs as he just wanted to go home early. As he finishes his sentence, he kills both of the bodyguards and puts Zigana down. He already told them his intentions, yet they dare to interrupt him like that? It's such a hassle to deal with morons, honestly. He tells the group to listen up, as he has something very important to say. From the great Gijima. This man is Hexagon, the executive. He tells them what Gijima told him, that they should think of this as a blessing, as if they are to interfere any longer. They will be swiftly dealt with, and they shouldn't think of running, as they have eyes everywhere, even closer than they would think. With that, the message is done, leaving both Ye Jin and Red surprised, as they can't believe someone would speak of such nonsense. But Hexagon tells them to not call the Majesty's words into question, as someone might end up getting hurt far more than they would expect. Ye Jin asks what his deal is in all of this. Is he a heavenly insect too? Red asks if he really came all the way here just to deliver the words of his boss one of the strongest people of the Insector world and a part of the Six-Legged Army, Hexagon says that he is correct. Even Mr. Kong had the potential to be in that same position, but it seems that he is unable to right now. Yejin thinks that monster was extremely strong. Are there really people that are much stronger than him? Hexagon tells them that they will not be reprimanded for this, as Kong was about to be condemned anyway, as Gijima has thought of his actions as too rash. Red asks why would they kill one of their own? Aren't they supposed to gather as many powerful people in that merry group of theirs? Hexagon explains that even if it's true that Mr. Kong had formidable power, he constantly went against Gijima's will, as insectors are the result of a magnificent evolution that only a few chosen few are lucky enough to have. 
Such magnificence shouldn't be insulted by trying to replicate it. In the grand plan of Gejima, who seeks to establish the insectors as the top of the food chain, Kong was nothing but a mere bug that thought of himself as something more. The six-legged army is waging war on humanity with the anticipated endgame being the complete annihilation of humanity. He would love nothing more than to eliminate them right now so that they won't interfere with their future plans. But alas, he will give them an opportunity, one that they would be foolish to refuse. All of them should join the celestial insects. Yejin tells him to go to hell, as she wasn't risking her life for that. She aims to kill all celestial insects, even Gijima. Hexagon lets out a scream to shut her up and tells her to consider it carefully as there are both merits and demerits in choosing to join them. Now, he would like an answer, yes or no. Both Yejin and Red find his offer very interesting, but they both flip him off at the same time and tell him to shove it. This makes him mad as he warned them previously to be more courteous. Red doesn't care about the war, neither about the genocide of humanity. Honestly, he doesn't even know what these guys are even fighting for, but if he wants to just sell him to the stronger guys, it's a no from him. As if they are stronger than Kong, he hopes to beat them down one day. Ye Jin explains that even if this is just business to him, she will not work under the ones who killed her own family. She would rather die. Hexagon strangely starts to laugh, as he hasn't heard such nonsense in such a long time. Are they out of their minds? They are such children, truly. He hasn't laughed like this in a while. He doesn't know exactly what they mean by their childish words. But well, since they made him laugh this hard, they can have this worm as he is no longer useful to them. Ye Jin asks how this is supposed to help them in any way, but Hexagon notes that he heard from Her Majesty that there is a loser among them who needs to eat insectors in order to survive. He had nothing to do with Zagana in the first place, so they can do whatever, kill him or not, it's entirely their choice. With that he wishes them farewell, while noting that they will be seeing each other again, sooner rather than later. After he disappears, Red says that this is just insane as he didn't expect for them to get so much attention from so many important people. But well, they should just go now, as he doesn't want any more visitors. With that they start flying away, with Red carrying Zagana. But once they arrive on the surface, they find that it's strangely quiet, with everyone probably evacuating already. Yejin notices that he grabbed Zagana and asks why he did that, with Red explaining that he just saw him slumped on the ground and thought it would be a shame to let such a fine specimen to rot down below. He was actually thinking of using him as a punching bag, as he seemed sturdy enough. That's when a bunch of bug reapers appear and signal the others that they found insectors, with Kim, who is outside, telling them to do their best right now as they need to stabilize the chaos that is outside. Yejin can't believe that they are in trouble again and covers all of their faces with silk as they run away, since they want to keep their identities hidden. The Reapers try to catch them, but Red blocks their path with a punch that creates tons of debris, and this allows them to go outside and fly away. Kim tries to shoot after them, but there's no way that he can hit them with a pistol from this much distance. The Bug Reapers manage to catch the unconscious Zagana and think that he's the last specimen on the premises, but they will double check. Pio thanks them for their work over the phone, but thinks that they are always one step behind, it seems. How unfortunate. He apologizes to the other members of the board for being late, but now, it's time for the executive meeting to begin. At the Supreme Command headquarters of the Bug Reapers, the meeting is taking place, with the D branch manager, Mr. Ski, wondering why they are holding such a high-level meeting all of a sudden. The department head of the Jiyongi province, simply named A, says that it doesn't even make sense that they were summoned here by Pio, since they all hold higher rank than him. Joe, the team leader of the Bug Reaper C branch, agrees, as hierarchy is essential for a stable system, so he must say he is rather disappointed with this situation. Min, the manager of the E branch, tells them to stop being buzz skills, as even though they have higher ranks than Pio, it does not matter. So they should hear what they have to say, since they are already gathered here. The head of the Bug Reaper F branch says that this isn't just about their positions, as she heard that there have been lots of incidents in the two areas they are charged with, and the loss of personnel has also become higher. Thanks to them, and their uselessness, their image has shattered. The B branch manager says that he knows what everyone thinks of them, and he heard that this is a meeting to advise plans that prevent future useless sacrifices, so they should go ahead and begin. A asks why the most important thing is to prevent sacrifices, as he's certain that wasn't the case when he lost his disciple that was always on his side. He isn't even worthy of his title, as he just got stung a few times by insects and was promoted in no time because he killed them. What a joke. He also supported that experiment which could have potentially killed the master he vowed to protect. All of them here, even Pio, 
are kicking ass as special agents, so he has no right to just brush their concerns off like it's no big deal. He didn't do anything to make him treat him like a damn insect. In truth, isn't he just jealous of his powers? The B branch manager says that this has been irritating him for a while now. But why are they, the ones that are supposed to kill off any bugs they see, mingling with this worm, who could betray them at any point? Should he just kill him now and be done with it? He is certainly able to. He promises that much. A feels mad that he used that word once again, as he told him not to. But the G branch manager tells them to shut up already and get this meeting over with, as he is too tired for their needless yapping. Pio says that he's right, they should cut the small talk and get to the point. Indeed, as they said, they have been beaten by the insectors rather consistently. However, this gathering was not made so that they could self-reflect. They have gathered here to prepare for the very likely case of the insectors launching a full-on invasion. It's time for them to shift things into third gear and prepare for all-out war. Joe wonders if the bugs aren't doing the same as them, since it has come to this. Pio explains that he is correct. Recent movements have suggested that more and more bugs are gathering, and it would seem like they are just going on about their lives. But upon closer inspection, they have found out that they are all gathering around strong and intelligent insectors, forming a group called the Celestial Insectors, something which is very well organized from their investigations. The F branch leader says that they are gathering in quite suspicious places. Are they aiming to destroy the bell tower or something? Ski notes that in his time, he has faced a lot of bugs head on, but it seems like these aren't your average insectors. As Pio pulls out a book, he says that in order to withstand the attacks of the insectors, they need something that will rival them in power, something that they shouldn't expect. He gives them the book with the Ant Castle project, with them wondering what it is and who the people inside of it are. The B branch manager picks the book up and asks Pio what this book is about exactly. That's when the old man comes around and says that he will explain that himself and he doesn't know where they got that book, but they should stop flipping through it like that, as he has a personal connection to it, a painful one. Pio asks if he's the one that wrote it, but the old man denies it. It's his apprentice who did. Pio asks how much he knows about the project, and what his involvement with it is. The old man explains that he was just keeping an eye on it from the sidelines, as it was a top-secret initiative carried out by the research team before the Bug Reapers were transformed into different combat units. From the beginning, it was shrouded in mystery and confidentiality. However, the project proved to be a success, and three different subjects were created. Unfortunately, one eventful day, a mysterious explosion occurred at their holding facility, with the fire destroying almost all evidence of anything ever existing there. However, they were able to extract one test subject from that place. Pio is shocked when he hears this, and so he asks where this test subject is now, but the old man says that he doesn't have a clue as at the time it was above his pay grade and below his authority. Pio doesn't know what to do right now, so the old man suggests that, if they want power that rivals insectors, they should take the special vaccine he concocted. This makes all of the managers fall silent as they look at him. With excitement in his voice, he explains that he and Jin have been opposed to using it, but he should see the result for himself, as they are amazing. In fact, they have already proven it, since Lucky and his division already had their insector injections made. He was the B branch manager, Jin's apprentice before, but now he is a top special agent. He was already amazing, but through the tests, he became even stronger, even nominated for the department head title, as he keeps pushing and pushing this idea further and further. Jin's anger grows, so he smashes the table completely and tells him to shut up before he will say something he wishes he hasn't. A tells him that in the end, he is the same idealistic bastard. What's human dignity worth if so many people die for that dumb idea? He goes next to the old man and tells him to not be discouraged, as he is very positive about his research. So he agrees on letting his team take some of the vaccines and see how it goes. As they all walk away, Pio goes to Jin, and he's quite surprised by his reaction. Jin apologizes, as the topic the old man was talking about was too touchy, but they should go back to now. At the B branch of the Bug Reapers, deep below the earth, the now fully taken over Ro, who doesn't even recognize Ko as the same species as him, with a final blow, he incapacitates him, a burning hunger from within telling him to open that door and awaken, as that is his only objective in life. He opens the heavily armored door, revealing a very large figure, who was standing right outside it. Rose says that he has been waiting for him all of this time. This insector seems to be of the same species as Sun, an ant. As the mighty insector comes out of his confinement, Rose begs him to not leave him behind and awaken him as a true insector. He even bows down. The insector puts his hand over Ro's head, which he thinks will be to awaken. 
But then in a raspy and loud voice, the insector says that a mutant like him, who is never an insector to begin with, is not worthy of awakening. With that, he crushes his head fully, and the bug reapers who were at the facility start mobilizing against the escaped insector. When they arrive, they see that the Roko brothers are both dead, so they start opening fire on the thing using their high caliber weapons, but one of them wonders how the hell it managed to get out of confinement. Was the equipment they put in place faulty, or was it opened from the outside? The bullets do nothing to the insector, not even graze him. The insector wonders where he is, and then with a slash of his hand, he cuts all of the bug reapers there in half, even hitting a fuel pump that blows up, leaving behind him a trail of destruction and death. Eventually, Pio Jin and Tay arrive at the scene, with Pio speaking with Ko, who seems to be barely alive, but with the last of his power, he explains that the insectors have infiltrated their sector, so they shouldn't come, as it's already compromised. Jin asks if his smoke that they have in every containment cell isn't supposed to be the invincible bane of all insectors. But Pio says that he doesn't have all of the answers right now. Who knows what happened for it to not activate? Tay tells them to hold tight as they are almost there. But when they get in front of the sector, a pillar of flame arises. And shortly after, a giant explosion destroys the entire facility in front of their very eyes. Tay damns it all for not being able to make it in time. But Pio notices something even more shocking. That the specimen they were holding captive has breached containment. Jin tells him to not go. They should turn away and leave before he notices them. But Pio gets out of the car and tells Tay to get away and go back to headquarters, as there needs to be someone who will tell everyone about what happened. He doesn't want to at first because he can also fight, but Pio tells him that he's way out of his league here. He can't face something like this. Jin also gets out of the car and says that he's a real piece of work. Pio tells him to step back otherwise he won't guarantee his safety, but Jin says that he won't disturb him in his hunt. Rather, he will help him. Pio tells him to be careful, as he's very mad now so he will attack relentlessly. But Jin already knew that, so they both get into position to charge in. The Insector calls them a bunch of incompetent fools, and thus their legendary fight begins. Inside of a pretty nice home, Ye Jin walks around while admiring the house, but also questioning why people like this guy always have such nice living spaces. Yet she has to live in a one-by-one -one home. That's when she also notices Red's collection of trophies won at different boxing contests with a picture of him saying that he is the lightweight champion of the country. Red, who just came out of the shower, explains that he is happy with performing on this stage because it's difficult to avoid blood tests and doping scandals on the bigger ones. But now that he's out, she should also go take a shower since she's starting to stink. She notes that this type of living must be easy on him. He probably doesn't know how it is to live in a rooftop apartment since all he does is get money from punching people. Red says that he puts a lot of effort into faking his humanity. She should also know about that, but she tells him to shut up, as they should check on Sun. They go to the couch they placed him out. With him being passed out pretty peacefully, both of them think that he's recovering quite well. But Red wonders why she brought him here of all places. Something which makes Ye Jin slap him. As she treats his wounds, she says that this guy lives with his grandma, so if she sees him in this condition she will pass away. But Red still doesn't get why she didn't take him in her house. She notes that it's dirty there, as she didn't have time to clean up. Red then changes the subject, saying that he is different from other insectors as his blood is very red. And even the message left by Jijima was aimed towards him, as he looked at him the entire time. Yejin says that even so, she already knew something was up, as when she mentioned Jijima for the first time, his eyes immediately became filled with rage. His past certainly has to do with that monster, she is sure of it. Jin and Pio try to get through Gijima's defenses, but the ants won't even let them pass them allowing him to attack without worry. But the two aren't defenseless either, as they push away the first attack, and then they dash away from the next. Jin finds his abilities amazing, and Pio notes that it's just like how the Ant Castle Project Files said, the range of attack is really intuitive. Jin charges up his axe while noting he didn't sign up to fight mere ants, and then throws it, with Pio charging his axe with the energy he had stored up in his katana. The axe hits Gajima square in the chest, but Jin doesn't stop there as he also charges in and connects his two axes while hitting, dealing a powerful blow to Gajima. While in this position, he asks Gajima if he's part of the Insectors or a rebel. Gajima says that a lowly human like him wouldn't understand even if he tries, but Jin tells him to try him. With that, he pulls his axes out once again and moves to slash Gajima, which he succeeds to do multiple times. Gajima, unbothered by this, says that his skills are admirable, but he will now show the true pinnacle of power. 
In one movement, he cuts one of Jin's arms and legs off, with Pio screaming at him to back away. However, even in his injured state, he puts enough strength in his remaining arm to actually cut one of Gijima's arms, which he congratulates him for, and apologizes for calling him inferior all of this time. Unfortunately, this is as far as his strength will carry him. Jin thinks that this is it for him, this is how he's going to die. But Gijima suddenly moves right in front of Pio and says that he must already know about that case. Pio thinks that if he's talking about the Ant Castle project, he may be able to pull out more information from him. He says that the case is classified information. What is he trying to do with it? He shouldn't try to lie, as he knows everything about the project since he read it. Gajima explains that there is someone precious to him connected to it, someone that may be able to unify all of the insector kind and make them the rightful rulers of this world. Before Pio can ask more questions, Tay smashes the van into Gajima and tells him to get lost, but this doesn't stop him at all. His efforts are without any meaning. Gajima cuts the van in half with ease, but Tay manages to get out and tell Pio that he will buy them some much needed time, so with it he should go and take care of Jin. Pio asks him truthfully, how long does he think he will last against that monster? He is the devil incarnate, a being that defies all logic. Out of nowhere, a large bomb appears out of the sky and lands squarely on Gajima, who blocks it with his arm. But the explosion still happens, creating a small mushroom cloud. This was done by Kim who came by airplane and also apologizes for being late to the party. But they should hop on and leave this place, as it's not something they want to be caught in. With this diversion they managed to get away. Not because they outsmarted Gajima, but because he wanted to let them go. The next day, Ye Jin and Sun are the only ones at school. Because from the messages with Cho, Sun finds out that they were all supposed to go on a trip with their math teacher. But since they didn't show up at all, the schedule moved up and they went earlier. Ye Jin damned it all, as she really wanted to go on that trip. Why does everything fun happen when they are not around? To put the icing on the cake. She also lost her phone so she couldn't check the schedule. But she hasn't given up yet, and tells Sun that they should also go to Pohang, where the trip is being held. Sun asks how they are going to get there in the first place, making Ye Jin laugh. In situations like this, one needs to take advantage of their rich friend. Also, can she borrow his phone for a bit? When they go outside, she notes that she has found a way for them to get to Pohang a way that will make them arrive faster than anyone. That's when a large engine can be heard coming their way, and sure enough, a red expensive car parks right next to them. Out of it comes Red, who notes that they are truly arrogant to bother him like this in the middle of the day, but they should feel lucky he was in the mood for driving, so they should hop in already. Ye Jin immediately jumps in the front and notes that it's really nice to have a rich friend, with Sun just sitting behind, puzzled by this whole ordeal. He starts messaging his grandma and tells her about the trip, with her asking if he needs a ride to Pohang, but he says that it's fine, his friends already took care of it. He also lets out a small smile, but unfortunately things will not be all quiet, as a bug is watching them from above, its eyes fixated on the blood red car. The dragonflies of the land roam about, as it is their season after all, but some are unfortunate enough to be interrupted from their peaceful lives. Such a case is happening right now, as a senior soldier is bragging to the juniors about how fast his reflexes are, but he also notes that since it's their season, they are extremely good at eating. He will prove it by making Sehi eat it. Sehi, a shy and introverted person, can only stand still in fear as the senior asks if he's right, but when he doesn't answer, he asks again, this time with a much more deadpan face. Sehi immediately screams out that he's correct. The senior grabs him by his jaw and tells him to not speak so loud. But what's so good about these dragonflies now? Sehi says that they are jam-packed with nutrients, which the senior agrees. These are some good soldiers that any soldier needs, so he will allow him to taste it first. With that, the senior puts the dragonfly in Sehi's mouth, who immediately falls on the ground, but the senior tells him to swallow, as he will have to eat too if he spits it out. Okay, this sounds kind of sussy. As he and the other juniors walk away while talking about various things, Sehi suffers as he barely swallows the dragonfly, his eyes filled with a mix of regret and sorrow. Later in the day, they all play a game of football, with Sehi put as the goalkeeper, but he doesn't seem to be doing well. As his body is acting up after he ate that dragonfly, his teeth are gnawing at each other, and his blood runs cold. Eventually the ball gets to him, with the senior telling him to block it. But due to his awful condition, he doesn't even notice the ball as it flies past him. The senior immediately punches him to the ground while calling him a jerk, and then starts kicking him, while noting that this isn't a game, this was something to prove their excellence. But he is clueless, a clueless bastard who is worthless. As they walk away, one of the juniors wonders why he is so hard on him all the time, as it goes to crazy levels sometimes, but the other junior says that it's just how the situation is. 
He got targeted only because he was the weakest of them all. Truly a pitiful life. When the roll call happens, the sergeant notices that Sehi is shaky and his movements are stiff. So he asks what happened, but the senior who is right next to him tells him to shut up if he knows what's good for him. Sehi grits his teeth and as the sergeant asks again, he says that it's nothing. He bumped into someone while playing soccer. The sergeant believes him and continues on. Since fall is here, they should bring out their jackets so that they don't get cold. And also, if they have any issues, they can report them directly to him, as he is in his office at all times. With that, he dismisses them, what truly happened going unspoken by anyone. When night arrives, say he and the senior are left on guard duty, with the senior apologizing for hitting him so hard. But seriously, he shouldn't have sat around like a dumbass and let the ball go through. Like that. Say he doesn't even listen to him, as the dragonfly he swallowed starts growing. The senior asks if he's even listening, or does he want another beating? The dragonfly grows once again. The senior has had enough of his insolence and tries to slap him, but Sehi doesn't move at all even if he is slapped. The dragonfly engulfs Sehi's entire body. The senior screams at him, as he will write this up as insubordination. But that's when he notices that something is wrong, very wrong. Indeed there is. Sunhee's glasses fall on the ground, as he has fully transformed into an insector, ready to take his senior's life. In response, the senior has only one word to say. Fuck. The school kids are still on the road, with the teachers watching the news about a fire in a club near their city. One of the teachers asks the main one how much further, with the main teacher of the field trip saying that in about 10 minutes, they will arrive. Cho doesn't partake in the talking the other kids are doing as she stares out the window, but she also noticed that since that eventful day, her classmates have been looking at her like she did something. The one in front of her asks if she wants a lollipop, but in exchange she has to come with him during the trip. In response, Cho punches the air in his face, making him drop the lollipop. She tells him to not get riled up for nothing, since they will all go on this trip together. While he laments going on such a boring field trip, Cho bows down to pick up the lollipop. But that's when the newly transformed Sehi appears and guns down everyone in the bus, with the only exception being Cho, who was fortunate enough to duck. When she looks around, she notices her classmates' lifeless corpses, but Sehi is not done here as he opens up the bus vent and looks down on her. Sun and the gang fall silent while they drive towards their spot, but Red tries to break the ice by asking when they first awakened as insectors. Yejin feels that it's kind of a random question, but to encourage them to do it, Red tells him his story first. When he started boxing, he had a unique way of doing it, different from his peers, and because of this, he became the champion in no time. But once he got in an argument with a guy who was a supposed big shot, and when they got to the streets to settle the score, things got wild as that guy ambushed him with a bunch of gangsters, so he was beaten and basically left to die. However, he thought that this was infuriating, to be ganged on by a bunch of losers, so he wished to kill them all. That's when his emotions spiraled out of control, and he awakened. He was surprised by this fact, as he never showed signs of it before. But the second thing he wondered about was how exactly he became one. So when he became a member of the Six, he asked Hannah, who was pretty knowledgeable about it. She explained that in their lifespans, humans eat over 100 different types of insects, or get stinged. But when a human eats one, it's like some special genes from that entity seep into the body. With those infected being none the wiser about their condition, they live on like ordinary humans. However, once a special trigger happens, the genes from the insect become their flesh and blood. They awaken. That's when he realized he ate a ladybug some time ago, but he wonders where Hannah is now. With that, he tells Yejin to tell her story, which she does. She was helping her father with farm work, but she wanted to peek her head out of the window to feel the wind. Her father warned that bugs are coming, yet she didn't listen. That's when a moth flew straight down her gullet and she swallowed it, something which her father was very mad about. A few months after that, Kajima came and killed her parents. That was the day when she awakened. Red apologizes for bringing up bad memories, but moves on to Sun. How did he awaken? Sun says that it was from when he was young. He doesn't remember much though. Yejin notes that it's very convenient, but Red says that the memories may come back to him someday. Eventually they arrive in Pohang, but they notice that there's a line for some reason, and some soldiers too, something which one doesn't see often. A soldier comes to Red's car and salutes. Red asks if they can go through, as he has some students that want to go on a trip, but that's when Sun feels an insector nearby. Sure enough, the soldier explains that there is an insector issue currently, and he can't allow anyone to go through. Some explosions and gunshots can be heard from afar, with Yejin wondering what to do. 
but Sun tells him to drive, not back to Seoul, but in front. As there is an insector there, he can feel it. With that, Red salutes the soldier once again, but then revs up the engine and busts through their blockade with ease, as they surely didn't expect for a maniac to do something like this. Somewhere far away, the soldiers try to take down Sehi with everything they can, even explosives, but he's too swift in his new form and easily dodges their attacks, allowing him to cut through them like butter. With only one soldier remaining who is hiding behind the bushes, he calls for backup. Sehi slowly arms himself from the corpses of his past comrades, as the soldier warns the others to be careful, as the insector has used weapons before and is very deadly. As Sehi throws a grenade right on top of him, he screams out for help, as he is too mortified to do anything else. Unfortunately, the grenade pops right in front of his eyes and explodes. But the soldier miraculously survives this, as two bug reapers have protected him from the blast. The head of the F branch tells him that everything will be alright. He just needs to go back and report to his superiors about what happened. They will take care of this guy. Sehi asks why she had to go and ruin his fun, but the F branch head says that she hates the talkative ones. Well, he will not be able to talk in a few moments at least. Sehi points the gun towards the bug reaper's direction, but the F branch head tells him that bullets will not work against them. Sure enough, her two guards jump in front of her with their bulletproof clothes and protect her. Then, they jump in while Sehi is still unloading his mags on them, but they suddenly pull out their ranged whip weapons and stab Sehi in each of his wings, causing a surge of electricity to go through him. The F branch head also charges in, noting that it is quite funny for an insector to use guns like this, considering they are much more powerful, but it wouldn't be of any use anyway, as he would still lose, as he will do now. She charges up her fist to the maximum output of energy, and punches Sehi very hard, sending him flying. Sehi sits defeated with two of his hands cut off, and an eye shield broken. He still has his fighting spirit however, and tries to attack once again, but the F branch head swipes next to him and gives him a deadly kidney shot, allowing her to continue putting him down. She raises her fist and tells him that he should have stayed up already. Something which reminds him of the senior, the F branch head still punches him, but then he starts begging for his life as he has had enough, he surrenders. He also says that he's a soldier and that he does not wish to die like this. The F branch leader looks at him and says that this guy still has some sense in him, so they should tie him up. However, Sehi starts to convulse and grow, as he remembers what the seniors did to him. All of the bullying, all of the beatings he got. He transformed into this thing because of him. What did he do to deserve this type of treatment? Why was he the one to suffer like this? The F branch head guards jump in front of her as they notice that Sehi has transformed and is now shooting small insects out of his gaping mouth guns. The guards bulletproof cloaks do nothing against these metal bending insects and their pincers, so the F branch manager is bathed in their blood. Sehi tells her that she should have left him alone. Those bastards deserved it. All of them deserved it. The F branch head screams at the top of her lungs that he is a trickster rat. Sehi regenerates his wings and starts flying, while also telling his new dragonflies to charge in with tears in his eyes. They do just that, but the F branch head is not about to go down easily, so she zaps the small insectors away. But it seems that this was Sehi's plan, as he starts flying away. She is adamant on not letting him go, so she uses tons of power from her gloves to charge a shot and unleash it on Sehi, which lands squarely on his back. But unfortunately it does not stop him, as he begins flying away with even greater speed. The F branch leader continues to follow him throughout the forest. Eventually, Sun and the group arrive at the incident site, where they notice their school bus, but it's entirely empty and bloodied up. Red explains to someone that when they got here, the bus was just empty, which they find hard to believe. Even as Yejin searches, Red signals her to stop, as it's pointless. Sun decided to go on his own through the forest, but he is now speaking with Ye Jin, who asks if he found that insector yet. Sun denies it and says that he's moving fast, but what about their classmates? Are they safe? Ye Jin says that there's a problem, as the kids are nowhere to be seen, seeing that they have suddenly poofed out of existence like this. There is no doubt that they are being kept as a food source. He has that insector, before it is too late. Sun says that he understands and closes the call. He takes off his band-aid and charges in with even greater speed as he completely transforms, his eyes filled with the thrill of the hunt. Before the bus was emptied of the bodies, Cho couldn't believe that almost all of her classmates were dead, but that's when she heard the bus door open, as the insector who attacked them just came in. She hid behind one of the chairs and waited for him to go away, which he apparently did eventually, so she decided to call the cops as fast as she could before he could come back. That's when Spit landed on her phone. 
as the insector who she thought was gone was above her and was salivating at the thought of eating her. Eventually, Cho wakes up with the sight of her classmate's deceased corpse, but then notices where she is, a warehouse that is filled with corpses. Not only her classmates, but other people too, even soldiers. She freezes from the fear as the smell of the dead engulfs her very being. But that's when she notices the gaping hole in the warehouse, where suddenly, Sehi arrives, so she tries to play dead the best she can. He starts to mumble about orders and a bunch of other military keywords, but none of it really makes sense until he finally makes it to a corpse as his stomach is empty and he must fill it. Cho finally understands what he's doing behind her and she closes her eyes as he starts to eat the corpse's flesh in a medley of disgusting sounds, something which fills him with excitement and joy, so he starts eating even faster and bites even bigger. He rises in his new form, a red dragonfly that seems much more powerful than his green version. He goes to the opening and thinks that it's a bother he has to go in and fight again, but he cannot let the Bug Reaper bastards find his stash. Cho hides her breath and thinks that she needs to get out of here. Otherwise, she will be consumed just like how he devoured that soldier. That's when her phone starts buzzing and say he turns around, as he has heard it too. Cho wonders who is buzzing her phone, and her face lights up when she sees that it's Sun. She answers but she does not say a word. Instead, he says that he will take her answering as her being okay, so she should wait up as she's coming to save all of them, he promises. With a large thud, Sehi arrives right next to her, and she decides to turn around, as she knows that she cannot hide anymore. Sehi is still in his demented state, and grabs her by her neck. She begs him to let go and get his hands off of her, which makes him remember the times when the senior fed him a dragonfly, with him begging to be let go just like this girl is doing now. So he responds the same as the senior did that time. Why should he? He grips even tighter, and in her final moments, Cho begs someone to help, anyone, even Sun. That's when a black punch goes in Sehi's face and rips his hand off too. Sun has arrived to the rescue. She looks to see who rescued her and is shocked to see another insector, but this one has a much more gentle demeanor. As Sehi's arm falls to the ground, Cho looks closer at the insector who rescued her and notices that it's the same one that rescued her before. Sehi looks at him while noting that there's an intruder in the base while regenerating his hand. Sun creates a colony and tells it to protect Cho. Say he has had enough of his insolence and uses his newly made handgun to start firing at the intruders, but before he can do that, Sun charges in first. Say he starts firing at them with his new insector bullets, and the colony protects Cho with all of its power, the bullets going through it as it moves Cho around. Sun continues to charge in, but the insector bullets redirect themselves in his direction and try to hit him, but they are no match for his sheer force. Eventually he arrives next to Sehi and tries to punch him, but he dodges and they start trading blows with great effort, with none of them being able to hit each other in any meaningful way. Eventually Sun gains the advantage and punches his side with great force. But this doesn't stop Sehi, as he points the gun straight at Sun and shoots, with the bullets going right through him, making him bleed out of his mouth. Sehi rises in the air and uses the mini insectors to barrage Sun. They move in a circle and then suddenly strike them all at once, cutting him cleanly in half. Cho, who is still inside of the colony, wonders what is going on outside, as she hears a lot of fighting. Sehi stands over Sun, who is now cut in half, thinking that the intruder is done with. But that's when the real Sun appears behind him, and prepares to strike with a big claw. He succeeds, and sends Sehi through the wall with the force of the attack, but he gets up on his feet quick, and as Sun comes for him, he starts shooting again, this time with Sun being able to defend himself from the bullets. This was just a ruse, however as the real attack comes from behind, with tons of ants clustering up on Sehi, engulfing him entirely. After the attack is done, Sun goes to check on the body, but only finds one small wing and a leg, as Sehi is running away, with Cho in tow. She tells him to let go, but he obviously will not listen to her. Sun charges in to rescue her, but Sehi flies even faster away. Sun calls back his colony and calls it an idiot before telling it to come back, as they have to catch that insector no matter what happens. The colony transforms itself into wings that attach on Sun's back, allowing him to give chase to Sehi. Before she can even react, Sehi throws her away and tries to snipe her from the air, but Sun catches her and runs away from the gigantic bullet that is now following them. But fortunately, the F branch head arrives just in time and takes down Sehi with an extreme amount of power that is surging through her gloves, to the point where it starts to disintegrate him. Next, she moves on to Sun and tells him to let that kid go while she's being nice as she isn't without enough power to kill him too. When she first arrived at the scene, she saw when Sun rescued the girl from certain death, 
making her wonder if that insector's purpose is to really rescue the child or for other reasons. But she thought of it as impossible. Insectors only think about eating people. There is no way they would selflessly rescue someone. The charred Sehi falls to the ground, and the F branch head asks Sun if he's planning to keep that girl as a hostage. But Sun stays silent and doesn't say anything. This makes her think that he is not worth reasoning with, so she charges in with a punch which lands and takes Cho from him. As Sun flies away from the punch, she puts Cho down on the ground and covers her with the coat, while also picking up one of the badges and activating it, making her surge with power. With that she goes in, ready to rid of this insector and finish her job. Eventually Cho wakes up and sees that the black insector is now fighting a strange woman, a bug reaper. She tries to go through his defenses but she can't. As all this insector does is dodge and block, why isn't he attacking her? Did she miss something? She eventually attacks with enough power to send him down on the ground, allowing her to ask him, what is he trying to do? Was he really trying to protect that girl? Sun says that he was, so they should not be fighting like this and wasting time. That's when she says that only yesterday, 387 people died from insectors, including some of her colleagues. So did he really expect for her to be fooled and think that he actually is trying to protect a human? Unfortunately for him, she is not that gullible. She tries to punch him once again, but that's when someone from behind her screams at her to stop, that person being Cho, who asks her to not hurt that person. This surprised both the F branch head and Sun. Cho explains that this person was taking down other insectors and saving lives. With this not being the first time that he did it to her, he was her savior twice. So she should stop harming him, as he has done nothing wrong. The branch head grabs her tightly and tells her to listen. An insector is an insector no matter what they do. That thing behind her has killed and harmed humans constantly. And even if he did save her twice, how doesn't she know that he was just saving her for later? He may be aiming for her family and friends too. Is he ready to face the consequences if that were to happen? Cho can't help but remember the death and horror she experienced at the head of the insectors. So she wavers, as even if she is strong of character, things like this drag down even the toughest people. The branch head says that her colleagues too were ripped to shreds right in front of her eyes. Even recently, an insector who bargained to be left alive as he will help humanity survive escaped and is now on the loose. Sun believes that they are talking about Gijima, but why aren't they focusing all of their efforts on him instead of coming all of the way here? But perhaps Gijima found out about his existence and took the actions to get out of his jail. This makes much more sense than him just leaving that place. The branch head sends Cho away as she doesn't have anything to do in this fight. But that's when Sun pulls her and says that this is enough. Slowly, he removes his armor, noting that he promised to come save her. So here he is. This situation too, she can leave it to him, as he will bear all of the responsibility for it. In a dimly lit room, a person with white hair stands in a chair, tied in such a way that they cannot move at all. That's when a bluish ant climbs up to them and the person asks what took him so long. After the case is closed, the F branch head drives away with Cho in the back seat, wondering what to do about this new situation she is facing. The branch head calls and says that they have captured the insector that defected from the army, even though he is barely breathing right now. But unfortunately, they lost two great warriors that will be remembered. Additionally, they have captured the Black Ant, who seems to have ties with the Ant Castle project, so they should prepare a place to interrogate him once they arrive at HQ. When they eventually arrive, the guard there immediately lets them inside, but behind them is Red and Ye Jin, with Red noting that this would be the last place he thought of visiting ever, yet here they are. Ye Jin wonders what Sun is trying to do, as even now, she can't figure out how he thinks. Earlier, when she and Red were running to Sun's location because he was not answering the phone, she suddenly stopped Red in his tracks, as she saw that Sun was captured by the Bug Reapers. They immediately started getting mad, and slowly transform while running towards him. But that's when something budges into Red, who thinks that it was Ye Jin. But she confirmed that she had nothing to do with it. That's when they notice a very small colony standing next to them, which suddenly writes them a message using the ants, to not do anything harsh and stay away. They thought that this is Sun's way of speaking to them without being face to face. And sure enough, the little ant told them to follow him wherever he went, which confused them at first, but they decided to do as they were told. When Sun and the branch head arrive inside of the facility, the employees thank her for her hard work. She says that it was nothing, and tells them to take care of this little one first, as she is the only survivor, and she would like to know if she's fully healthy. As the employees start tending to her, Cho can only look at Sun, who looks back at her too. The branch head tells him that he's coming straight with her to the interrogation room, 
which he obliges with as he does not want to fight them. While Cho is being escorted to one of the rooms, she overhears someone arguing that someone being Jin, as Pio has suggested that he gets implants, something which he does not like. Pio comforts him. He knows that this is not the best situation, but it's what the doctors recommended. It's for his health. Cho notices that the old guy with glasses was the same one that asked her questions before, and the employee says that unfortunately they had some casualties, but she doesn't need to see that now. Jin says that he just cannot infuse himself with something of unknown origin. He already knows full well why. He still remembers the day when his disciples said that he would devote himself to learning even more, as there is no real way to protect everyone. So he will take the insector injection in order to find a way. He told him at the time to stop, as it would change him more than he thinks, but he did not listen to him, not a word. Even if taking the injection and the implants is the right course of action, relying on other powers than that of his own is trampling on his beliefs, so he refuses. Pio asks if he's really going to fight like this to the end, which Jin confirms. Pio expected this, but even if he is like this with only one leg and arm, he can still be classified as the strongest bug reaper there is. Jin smiles and says that this is only natural. A guy like him can be much more helpful in terms of power, but these disabilities will not impede him from using that power for the greater good. Suddenly Pio gets a call that when he answers, his eyes widen with shock. He immediately rushes out of the room and says that there is something he must attend to, and when he arrives he looks straight at Sun, who looks back at him. The F branch head asks if he's doing well, as he was pretty injured when he came back. Pio says that he is fine. He came straight here when he heard what she said, but is this kid really the one? The F branch head confirms that it's true. He said that he knows the purpose of Gijima, so he shouldn't be underestimated. Additionally, he is the number one result of the Ant Castle project, the one that he has been researching all of this time. The three of them go into an interrogation room, with a lot of researchers sitting behind the screen to eagerly hear what they have to say. Pio looks at Sun and thinks that previously, he thought that the number one subject was the woman, but in reality, it was referring to this boy? For now, they can put that aside as it's time to ask him some questions. Sun says that Yajima, the self-proclaimed majesty of the insectors, already knows that he is a product of this experiment, making Pio wonder if he is one of his soldiers or something. Sun denies that completely. He may not have a good memory of his childhood, but he knows exactly what type of creature Yajima is, and he does not want to be like him. He is the second project, a hybrid creature that combined the strongest insector genes and the ant castle project, a true force of nature. Someone that should not be trifled with. Pio wonders how he knows about all of this, and if he is actually a reliable source of information considering he lost his memory. Sun continues, saying that Yajima is the vessel that will hold everything together, be it insectors or humans, also his brother is the same. The others did not expect for him to have a brother, and this gets the other researchers talking. Pio notes that he said previously that he knows his whereabouts, so can he direct them there? Sun says that he already called someone over who is managing all of this stuff, something which confuses Pio. At the entrance of the room, a tall man arrives and tells the guards that they are here to meet with Sun. The researchers are also made to stop the interrogation, with Pio asking what for, as they are not done yet. All of the researchers stand up together and bow down to the boss, who at first seems to be this tall and elderly man, but then he tells the real boss that now she can come in, that person being Sun Grandma. She tells them to stop staring around like there's something to see. She is just a grandma who came to visit her grandson. This woman, Jiam, is the founder of the Bug Reapers. The different researchers are amazed to see the founder in this place, with some of them not even seeing her ever before. The senior researcher bows down to her and asks how she's been doing. She says that since she left things with them, she's been able to live a comfortable and easy life. But how are they doing these days? Everything good. He confirms everything is fine, but he hears that she is here to see who they have captured, an insector that could shed light on some things. She says that she doesn't care about that, she is here to see her grandchild. The researchers are stumped for a moment, but then they all scream out in surprise, as they did not expect her to say something like that. Pio and the branch head wonder what is going on, and in a panic the researchers tell them to let go of that boy now. Before they can do so, Sun is already out of his restraints, something he was able to do the moment they put them on him. He asks the branch head if he can help him with these, which she agrees, but she shouldn't try anything while he is free, as she can still take him down. Sun tells her to relax, as just doesn't want to make his grandma sad. Eventually she arrives in the interrogation room and is very glad to see him, with Sun smiling and crouching down to her level, asking if she's been well. She asks if he has eaten anything yet, and Pio wonders what is going on, 
If he is her grandson, does that mean the founder also knows about this project? Just how much involvement does she have in it? He also greets her and she greets him back, but suggests that they go somewhere else and eat while she explains, since this room will just ruin the atmosphere. They go to a dining hall and the grandma plates up a table, telling them to enjoy what she cooked and also inviting her assistant to it. With that, they all begin gulping down the food that she cooked in every way possible. After they are done, the grandma says that she owes them some explanations, but first things first, she will tell them about how the bug reapers came to be. About 18 years ago, the summer was pretty hot, and the cicadas were buzzing louder than usual, and she was the owner of a pretty renowned company. Her assistant was still with her even then, who wanted to give her some reports, but she told him to wait, as she was talking with her son. Her son was a police officer, who was now talking with her about the food that she keeps sending, which he is thankful for, as he can survive off of it. He also gave some to his friends, which they thoroughly enjoyed. She was glad to hear that and asked how his duties are going nowadays. He explained that soon, he will get promoted. Soon he will be like his father. She congratulated him for this and was happy for him. But he should take care of his body too, right? He agreed and said that he will. But that's when another officer screamed at him from HQ and told him to quickly get on duty, as there is a reported murder case that just came to their doorstep. He apologized to his mother and closed the call, with her thinking that the signal just cut off. The assistant told her that thanks to him, she will feel comfortable on the streets. But she says that she would rather have him take over her business instead of becoming a cop like his father. The assistant noted that it meant that he just respects his father a lot, it only shows how well he was raised. She told him to stop or she would blush, but shortly afterwards they got back to work, talking about their overseas exports and relations with other businesses that were sure to bring in more money at the end of the year. The cicadas suddenly became silent as they started to shed their old skin and become anew. When her son got to the murder scene, the perpetrator was also there. But it wasn't any normal criminal. It was the first of the insectors, a being that defied all logic. Because of how much he consumed, just like the cicadas, he shed his old skin and shines more beautifully. The only difference was that this one evolved through the blood of others. Her son tried to defend himself, but he could not win against the thing. So he lost his life, letting the insector roam free. When she heard about it, she was destroyed. She didn't even know what to live for anymore, as he left just like his father did. They heard from the man who did the autopsy that the wounds he had couldn't have been man-made. No, these wounds, the way they were made, were from a beast. A beast that defies all logic. She cried as much as she could, but those tears eventually turned into anger and sorrow. When they got back to the office, she promised to find the bastard who killed her son, no matter what. That's when an opportunity came to her doorstep, with two people who were informed about this. The assistant told her that they have guests, with her denying them entry at first, but that's when he said that they have information about her son and his death. With that, they were led inside and explained to her that the things that killed her son were bugs. The man showed her real pictures, while explaining that their objective is to take down these things that they call insectors, bugs that hunt humans. The man introduced himself as Gashi Chiel, the mastermind behind the Insector Resistance Project. He came to her doorstep with the hopes that she would support their project, as they don't want others to suffer the same fate that her son did, and he is sure that she also doesn't want that. All they want from her is support on the Ant Castle project they are conducting. She said that she really wanted revenge for her son, but how was she supposed to believe such a thing with only a few pictures? She isn't crazy. Gashi said that this is only natural and invited that person to come in. As the door swung open, red ants started to come out, and eventually a woman insector appeared right in front of them. She was naturally scared and told her assistant to report to the police immediately, but Gashi told her to listen first. The being they are seeing now is the only one that can save humanity from certain doom, the prototype of the Ant Castle project, Subject Zero, Gami Jin. Thank you for watching. See you next time.